Hello, everybody. This is Chris Schmidt with Rocket Lasso Live. We are in Season 1, Episode 3, and thank you all for joining me and checking this out later online. So, uh, we just got a couple notes to uh, to start this one out, and before we get right to questions, we've already got lots of people hanging out. We've already got lots of uh, questions popping in. Uh, we just had a little technical difficulty where I clicked the wrong microphone button. Uh, okay, so in any case, uh, some quick notes. Uh, tomorrow is going to be the first... Uh, practice live stream of the bonus stream. So if you're not already on Patreon, make sure you go check that out so you can become part of the bonus stream where we do more long form projects. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, next week is going to be NAB. So I'm going to be away for that. So there will not be a regular Wednesday show that week, but I will be live on c4dlive.com for my presentation, which is on Thursday. I think it might be an hour and a half later then now it's like a week from right now and then plus an hour and a half plus a day. So that should be fun. And I, my presentation is on advanced dynamics. So that should be exciting. In fact, it's shifting a little bit as I kind of put together the final details. It's turning more into like tips and tricks about dynamics. So it's more like rapidly going through a bunch of really fun things. And I've actually made a couple, I've learned a couple of things about dynamics. I didn't know even while putting this presentation together. So that part is going to be really exciting. Um, the, uh, so along those lines, uh, yeah, to make sure you tune in and check that out. And there's gonna be lots of great presentations from everybody. So that should be really good. Uh, in addition to that, if you're going to be at NAB, uh, go ahead and switch my screen over here. Uh, I've been 3d printing out these cool little rocket things. So, uh, I'm going to be giving these to people who, uh, who come and ask me about them. Uh, you see, I've been mass producing them on my 3d printer. It's been fun, but I've been having to do a lot of interesting troubleshooting on the 3d printer. Also on that front, I just received my multi-material unit, which is an upgrade. So I can print up the three different types of material kind of simultaneously. So I'm not going to play with that until after I get back from the trip, but it should be good. Um, and was there anything else? No, I think that kind of covers all the important notes. So we are going to get to questions here. Let me see if I can get the proper setting to pop up here with the camera and the chat. The chat doesn't show anything, but at least everybody can read a little bit here. Uh, and then yada go, I do see the messages, but I just happened to see the chat faster because I was up on the screen. So uh, let's get going here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start clicking links. Uh, once again, quick note on the rules. If you're clinking to a video, make sure you link to the specific time code so I can answer that specific question and I need to be able to see who the artist is. Otherwise, I am not tackling that question. So uh, I'm going to, and as you know, I randomly jump around in the chat to try different links. So I'm going to be clicking on Umbrella's link here, which is a link to Behance. Uh, and you're asking about how to render a picture like this. So let's go ahead and switch our screen over. And let's see what we've got here. Ooh, look at this. This is neat. So, oh man, you guys like these, uh, these like European names are, I'm going to murder them. So Mandraska Bas Besta, Mandraska Besta. I don't know. There's probably a really cool way to pronounce that. It was great when uh, Ivan used to be on the streams because he could pronounce everything properly. Uh, but let's check out what we got here. Well, first of all, we've got uh, some 2D illustrations, but uh, there is totally some cool stuff that we could do in 3D to tackle these. So yeah, this design is really sharp. Uh, and honestly, there's, there's even a little piece of artwork that I've been almost obsessed with um, that stylistically, it's got a couple of hints like this and I've been trying to think about it. Uh, but this one, I think there's a couple things we could do that's pretty straightforward. Uh, to tackle along these lines. Um, I guess some specifics might matter, and presumably something like this was made in Illustrator. But uh, let's go ahead and see if we can start throwing something together kind of quickly. So let me go ahead and adjust my microphone just a little bit so I'm not bump bumping my hand against it. And let's start this one off properly. So I'm going to click over on the Cinema 4D. Ooh, this is a little preview of uh, some of my presentation I'm working on. I'll just hit play here because it's cool. So I will be talking about this in uh, at my NAB presentation. Yep, and look how fast that's running. It's crazy. It's really cool. Um, completely different way of rigging up dynamics. So let's go ahead and open up a new file and look at uh, making or you know making some of those cool gradient shapes. Now, one of the things is in the overall composition that we see here is there's a lot going on. Like we've got some clouds, we've got this building, we got stairs. So there's like a lot of material to work with there. And I don't know how handy we have any of that stuff. If I jump into my presets, I it's kind of hoping I, I don't currently have the 
Grayscale Gorilla. Well, it's not. It's actually the Happy Toolbox, which is sold by Grayscale Gorilla. Uh, the model pack, uh, the Happy Model Pack, and I don't have that handy. That would have been really, really nice to have on here. So we're just going to have to model up some stuff really quick. Um, so what's something? I don't want to emulate exactly what they have. So let's try and think of something fun here. Uh, let's see. Why don't we do a low poly scene? We'll do some fun low poly clouds really quickly. And then we will, what's, I, I think a building is still a good idea. We can get some basic trees going. Actually, some trees would be really nice. So we'll get kind of a forest and then we'll get like a, a watchtower type of thing. So let's start putting this together. Um, everything's going to be very low poly and, uh, we, we actually might be able to use that a little bit to our advantage, but let's just start throwing stuff together really quick because the geometry here is not the main part. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and create the cylinder. I'm going to reduce its segments way down. Let's go ahead and make some a couple of incredibly fast trees. And once again, we're going to be cloning a bunch of these, so I want as few segments as needed to keep the shape going. So there we go. We get a cone there. We're going to make that a child of that shape. Let's go ahead and move this up into the air. So there's one pine tree, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a null and let's move this, put that as a child of null and move this up into the air. So it's actually going to spawn from the correct spot. So we'll just call this tree one. Let's go ahead and copy and paste. We'll make a couple of quick variations on the tree. First of all, we'll make a really tall, skinny variation. So that will just be tree two and we'll copy and paste the first one again. And I'm going to make a null and just call this trees for now because we're going to hide it. And that way I can keep on throwing these trees in there so they just disappear on me. Uh, okay, and then this one is going to be really simple. I'm going to copy this cone. We'll make a copy like that and then we'll copy it again. And we'll do that. Now we could have made a cloner and done that, but, you know, it's, we're just doing it as quick as possible. So pretty straightforward there. Uh, and, then, you know, it, it, we can make infinite interesting variations on trees. We could uh, go ahead and copy and paste tree number one here. And on this one, we could grab our cone and turn on our bottom caps. And now you see we get some nice rounding there. And I could change our segments. We could increase the radius. We could grab our overall radius and increase that. And making these things is super fun. So boom, like a completely different tree. We make that overall shape taller. Like I like that bevel. So okay, cool. That's tree four. And now we'll just put that down to the rest of the collection. And if we wanted to see them, we could grab all of four trees here, and they might be a little bit big overall. But I think that, yeah, if you could, if I make a cube, I always, I didn't know what the scale was here. So I made a cube, and I see that I know a cube is 200. So that's 200 across. So that means I can grab all these trees. If I wanted to see all of them, I can just click on their X, and I'm going to type in X, which is their current number, times, let's just say 300. And now, oh, not, um... Was it X times 300? What did I do wrong there? Is it X? What am I doing wrong here? Well, it's Z for one, but isn't it just X times? I mean, X should be the index. Am I completely blinking? X times 300. N times 300? What, did they change it? No, it's not N. Okay, I... Okay, I completely thrown off there something is uh well i just tried n and i tried x and whatever reason that's not doing its thing that's really weird uh, maybe i maybe they changed the shortcut maybe i'm doing something wrong i don't know um so okay uh now i can see all of them together i think the trunk is actually a little long on some of these so i'm gonna pull that down grab this and that and that pull those down this one's a little small overall so i'm going to select that one t for scale scale it up and now it's way too big up there so i just wanted to get a vibe of them overall so boom Three different random trees. Oh, num? Is it num now? Well, okay. If it, I thought it was. I could have sworn it was x, but let's try num. Uh, num times three hundred. So I zeroed them all out. If I type in num times three hundred, then it's going to take each one the index, so it's number, and they go boop 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 boop. Uh, oh, maybe no. Maybe X is just the time. I don't know. Uh, I, maybe I'm losing my mind. But anyway, that, that's, that's a quick way of spreading them out. So now we've got all of our different types of trees. That's all good. Let's make a cloner. Let's go ahead and throw these into that cloner. And in fact, why don't we go and we're going to keep this relatively organized because we're going to make a whole scene here, which could be cool. And why don't we go ahead and clone these onto an entire landscape? So I'm going to, let's make our landscape from scratch. We could just make the landscape object, which is cool, but limited. So let's go ahead and make a whole landscape here. So we've got this plane object. Let's go ahead and make this 
55 by 55. You know, a, a lot of polygons, but not insane. So, um, let's see. Yes, thank you, Nick, or, uh, yeah, Nico, for putting in the num. I don't know if I was just completely blanking on that. But in any case, uh, let's go ahead and displace this thing. We want to see it in the viewport, so I'm going to create a displace deformer. Make it a child. Now that it's a child, let's go ahead and make a noise. And we want to have a big effect here, so let's go ahead and start cranking this. Now, I'm actually going to want to go pretty dang far, so I'm going to make this like 3,000. So this is a pretty big effect it might be having. In fact, I'm going to go bigger. Let's go 5,000. So this can have a huge effect. So now we can go into our noise type here. And I can start modifying it with different types of noise. So we can go to our little preview here. We can go to something like, I mean, I'm a, I'm a sucker for uh, Naki. Uh, so we can make Naki, and then we add a zero here. Not enough. Add another zero. You'll see that I'm making changes by orders of magnitude because you see that I actually had to do that. Like, I had to add on like four zeros there or three zeros before it actually kind of got to the scale I was hoping to get. But uh, overall, I do like the way that is giving us this overall shape. Uh, now, I, I don't want these like peaks to just kind of terminate on the end like that. So we're going to actually go up a layer and grab our noise. And I'm going to also throw in a layer. But you know what? We're in R20, so let's not do it with a layer. Uh, instead of using a layer like that, why don't we make this a little bit more dynamic and we'll go to our fall off and I'm going to create in the R20 fall offs, I'm going to make ourselves a box field and this box field, I'm going to make it super tall. It can be pretty much infinitely tall. And then how big do we make this plane? I'm just going to copy its number and go into our box field and set the X and Z to that size. And now it should be as big as the overall shape. Although it does seem to double the size, which is a little strange. Maybe that's the inner fall off, which is, well, anyway, in any case, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah, it made it way too wide. Maybe it's one of those things where you have to like cut the number in half. So anyway, the point being is now the box has a fall off. So you see that this thing is only being affected on the inside. So I can grab this fall off and pull it way out. And you'll see that it's erasing that out. So another thing you'll notice is that everything is pulling in and out. You can see it can go up and it can go down. I actually just want it to go up. So in our displacer, I can go to our object tab. And instead of intensity centered, I want just intensity. So you see it's pushing up everywhere. So that is fun. But let's go back to our fall off here. And I want a little bit smoother of a fall off. So as we make this larger, you can see we get a smoother fall off on the overall and and now we're able to do that. I was an alternative way would be to apply it like a gradient, like overlay a gradient with our noise. But now we have this fall off, and now we don't have to worry about projection mapping. It's just whatever the shape is. If we were inclined, we could even grab this and say, you know what? Let's do a cylindrical fall off here. And then if we were to increase our radius, then we could have a spherical fall off with the same effect. And it's really it's kind of nice and interactive in the viewport. And to tell you the truth, I think a spherical fall off might be better for what uh, I'm kind of going for here. So I do want a nice, small, smooth fall off here. And we can raise that maybe beyond it. But all, some of those ones on the edge won't be seen. But that's working pretty well. I'm pretty happy with that. And because it kind of chilled out the overall shape uh, or some of the peaks in the mountains, I might even push this a little bit further. So yeah, uh, just cool way of offsetting that a little bit more. So now we got some more varied terrain on there. So now that we've got that, let's go ahead and call that ground. And let's go ahead and grab our cloner. And let's go ahead and clone a bunch of trees onto an object. And the object is, of course, going to be our ground. And we got a bunch of trees appearing. I'm going to say don't... Uh, there's a couple of things we could do to get these rotated correctly. But the easiest way actually right now, because we want them pointed straight up, is we can turn off a line clone. And now it's not worrying about the rotation. It's just moving them into specific places. So now we've got a bunch of clones randomly being placed around, which is cool. Uh, and it's automatically set it to surface, which is uh, probably extra good because now we can go and just increase our count and we can make more or less of them around as we go. So we can just go ahead and make a ton of these. And the extra cool thing is we can set this to multi-instance. And that would mean we can make a ton of these uh, without really getting much in the way of slowdown. So you see we got this really dense forest and it's going to be running really quickly for us. Um, and now in addition, so we've got a whole bunch of them. They're randomly scaling around. That's all good. Why don't we go ahead and create a random effector? And this random effector will be for the scale. So we're going to scale the trees randomly. Um, 
I'm gonna make one of I'm gonna make two random effectors actually for scale. One of them I'm gonna have be just pure random scale, so it's gonna randomly scale these up and down. I don't want too much variation. We'll say like you know 0.25, and now there's a lot of variation they have in the scale up and down. And then I can go and grab that same random tree. And actually, before we go this, I'm just gonna call this one scale, random scale. And I'll just grab the tree again. Let's go ahead and make another effector, another random effector. And this one, I'm gonna say, I also want it to do scale, but this time I just want the scale on Y. So let's see, we can give that like a 0.5. And now some of them are gonna be really squat and some of them are gonna be really tall. Now, if we didn't want, you can see some of these are getting really squat, which stylistically could be fine. But if you wanted to, in this effector, we have one that's randomly scaling them overall, and now one that's stretching them up and down. The reason we did that is if we if we set this one to like every axis, then we're going to get like some weird skinny trees here, and I didn't want that. So that's why we made two different random effectors. So now that we've got that, oh, so now you see some of them are getting taller and some are getting skinnier, but we can make them only get taller or only get skinnier if we go to the effect tab here, we go to min and max, and you see it's actually got a minimum of negative 100, so it can actually go down as well as up in value. So if we go and we start pulling this up again, then if this is at zero, it's only going to ever make them taller. It's either equal or taller. I'm actually gonna say, you know what, you can go a little bit down, just not too far down. I don't want them ever getting too squat. But now you can see we've got a whole bunch of different randomly scaled trees looking good. And now let's go ahead and rename this one scale Y. And let's see. Um, and okay, so there's scale on Y. And then let's go ahead and I guess a push apart might be good here. I just, I don't want them to float away from the surface here. I guess we could have them scale down, which is a good way of doing it. Anyway, let's make another MoGraph effector and let's go to push apart. And now push apart could do a good job of pushing them away. So you'll see, uh, as I, if I were to drag the strength, you can see that the trees are touching each other. I can make them start pushing apart from each other. Now, if we go and we start making the radius bigger, which I guess should be probably around 200. We can go a little less. And you'll see it'll push them all apart, and now none of them are touching. But I suspect, yeah, that because it's pushing them apart, that some of them could be like on the ground over here, and it floats it away so it's no longer touching the ground. So this push apart isn't working too great for this overall effect because we're going to get floating trees. Now, there might be a way of like reprojecting them down onto the surface, but an immediate way isn't coming to mind. So a complete alternative would be to scale them apart. So now, if they're too close in radius, it's going to scale them down, but that means it won't change its position. Now, I don't think we need too big of a radius here. Let's go ahead and scale this a little bit, and let's look at like a pretty tight cluster of trees. Like This one's pretty tight. So if we start increasing our radius, you can see that pretty quickly they start scaling them away. And if our radius gets too big, a lot of our forest will shrink down to nothing. And I don't want to go too far. Just maybe push them away, you know, yeah, a little bit of scaling apart and the rest of the them bumping into each other is fine. As another alternative, we could say hide them. Um, so I think this is going to make, yeah, when too many trees are close together, it's just going to make them pop out of existence, which is another viable option. So they kind of stop existing. And if too many disappeared, we could just start adding more clones and it'll fill in the open gap. So that's actually working pretty well. I'm pretty happy with that idea. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and give this a quick save because we've already done a decent amount of work here. Let's jump on up here to episode three, scene files, and we'll just call this... Um, Gradient colorizing landscape um, number one. So another quick thing to note is if you are if you support me on Patreon, you actually get access to these scene files if you're supporting at the twenty dollar level. Um, so you would get all these scene file all these scene files pretty much the day after uh, this live stream happens. So uh, just throwing that out there. But in any case, let us continue. So. We got our trees. Uh, that's a pretty good, fun layout. Let's go ahead and get some um, some nice low poly. In fact, we are kind of going for a low poly thing here. So it just popped in my head that we didn't make these trees very low poly. So what we could do is go and make these lower poly. So we can go ahead and just search for the word, the letter C, O, and now we get all of the cones. I can grab all the cones and simultaneously say, drop them down to six polygons. And then we can go and type in C, Y, and now we're only going to get these cylinders. And I can select the cylinders and let's only make those mm, five around. 
and we can go ahead and hit the little X there, clear that out, turn off the magnifying glass, and now we go back to the entire scene. So I was able to really quickly update all of those. And even though we only had a couple trees, I could select the things even quicker that way. All right, nice and low poly. So let's worry about some low poly clouds now. I'm going to go ahead and make a couple different shapes. Let's go ahead and start out with a plate tonic. I think is how you say the name on that one. And let's go ahead and make a sphere. And mm, we'll probably make two platonics, we'll two different types of those. So what I want to do is grab all three of these. I'm going to move them up into the air. And these are also going to be clouds, so they need to be way bigger. So I'm going to get letter T, scale them way up. And let's start out with our sphere. I want a nice low poly sphere. So typically, I go with the icosahedron which is very, they're not perfect, but these are pretty dang even sized triangles, which just generically is a really cool layout uh, to work from there. So we're gonna drop that down to about that many polys. I think that is awesome. So let's go ahead to our plate tonic and I'm going to add in one subdivision here. So that's pretty good for that one. And let's go to our other plate tonic and let's try some of these other modes. So we can try tetra, that's just a triangle. Octa, not terribly exciting. Dodeca, dodeca is interesting. I like the dodeca. Let's do a dodeca with one subdivision, and let's actually try one more because we can also probably let's try the icosahedron. Oh, that's where we started. But we can do a bucky ball, and the bucky ball is also pretty fun. But that one only needs one subdivision because it's already got a decent number of polys on it as well. So now we got three different or four different types of cloud shapes. Um, I guess we'll just make another cloner really quick and another quick save. Let's go ahead and drop all of these in there. Let's go ahead and name this cloner clouds. And I'm going to make it a honeycomb grid because I love those honeycombs. Uh, so the cloners down on the ground, so they all move down there. I can pull it up into the air. The honeycomb is naturally set to Z. I wish they did this in all the, all, all the different objects. You know, there's a lot of different objects in cinema where it's like, which plane are you on? The X, Y, the X, you know, Z, the X. But then here they said they just put Z, X, Y. It's so much quicker to be like, oh, Y. I want to point it up on Y. Done. Don't even have to think about it. So a little thing that would be a nice uh, default to appear on all objects. So let's go ahead and spread this out. In fact, we're probably going to see a lot further into the distance. So let's go ahead and go overboard here and really scale these out. Um, to tell you the truth, that's probably, this is still probably not even close. I'm going to say times four times four so now those are way out there so kind of no matter where our angle is we should see quite a few uh now that's per step i'm going to do there's of course on a lot of the cloner options there's two different modes there's per step so right now it's going this far between each step but now it's the overall scale of what i want it to be so i'm going to say that is now representing the end point and now i can add additional clones in here so i can go and like increase the count here and see we'll get more of them uh yeah, more of them copied uh, without changing the end scale on the the uh, distances here. So cool. Now that we got that, we can go ahead and grab our, all of our overall shapes. I'm gonna hit T for scale, scale them all up a little bit, and now we can go and start putting in some effectors here. So let's go and grab an effector. Let's say, um, a random effector, of course. And now we can do some overall. Well, I guess now we can do some position some random position. So we're going to push this up on Y. Let's see, what's a good number? Type in one, 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 one. Okay, still pretty mild. Let's do five, 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 five. Okay, there we go. Now we're getting a little bit of variation there. In fact, a little too strong. Let's do three, 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 three. Uh, and then we can do a bunch on X. So let's do another three, 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 three. Uh, that could probably even be more like five, 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 five. There we go. Some nice little variation. Spacing that all out. The overall shapes should probably go up into the air. And uh, the same random effector can also help us affect the scale. So I'm going to use this one to be uniform scale. So let's go ahead and say that these could be, um, I don't want to go too far again. So let's say 0.33. Yeah, so we get some variation in scale there because it's going up and down. I didn't want to go too far. Uh, also, these are so big now that you see the clipping. You'll see that some of these are clipping out of existence as they get a certain distance away because our scene is so big. So actually, why don't we fix that right now? And I always kind of forget where it is, but I bet we can find it. I'm going to try starting with going to our viewport settings, Alt-V, and make sure I click on this window so it actually is acknowledging that one. And let's see if we go to display. No, nope, no. Back HUD, nope, nope, nope. Okay, it was none of those. I'm gonna do the project settings, Control or Command D, 
And let's go to project settings. Info, no, 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 no. Dang it, I always forget where this one is. What is, where's the other settings that we have? Um, pro, it's the project settings. I am in project settings. Oh, view clipping. Well, I almost, geez, all right. okay, sorry. It's under the tab of view clipping. So I, I was right in the project settings. So uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Zalam. Um, but, 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 okay, so here's our far, our near distance is one, our far distance, let's just add a zero on there, and boop, you now see all of our extra copies get put in. So if your things are getting clipped out, you can shrink, if you're getting very near something, it's cutting away, then you can shrink this first number, and if it's too far and it's getting clipped out, you can increase it there. Um, so yeah, that's working out well. All right, so, um, uh, ba, 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 okay, so we got some nice clouds going here. Let's go ahead and rename this one rotation and scale and now let's also add in I think I want to stretch all these clouds out in the same direction so I'm going to actually just go to our cloner that's got all the clouds in it and let's grab our um, arbitrary it's X or Z it doesn't really matter I'm gonna just start stretching them out like that yep that's pretty much what I was hoping for so some nice kind of wider fluffier type things and now what I'm thinking is we should deform these to make them kind of be a little bit more jagged in, in all sorts of directions. So my thought there is, let's hit save real quick, and I'm going to make a, let's put the cloner clouds into a group. So I'm going to hit Alt G while it's selected. And let's go ahead and just rename that clouds. And now we can go and use a deformer on these. Now we could use another displace deformer, but I heard from someone at Maxon that technically the plane effector will calculate a little bit quicker than the displace deformer. So why not? Uh, I'm going to put in this plane and this plane effector is going to act as a deformer. So I want it to affect the points of the object. And now that it is doing that, we can go to its fall off tab and we can feed it something like a shader field or something that calculates way faster than the shader field is just feed it another random effector. So we can add it a random field and let's go ahead and make sure that we are deforming this really heavily. So I'm gonna say 100, still not enough. Let's do 10,000. Now you can definitely tell it is working. So now we can chill this out. Let's say 2000, yeah, 2000 may be a little, intense but let's go ahead with 3000 yeah so now these are being heavily deformed but now we're in this plane effector and we're feeding it this random field and in the random field right now it's just taking every point and randomly pushing it out on y but we could change the mode from random to noise and now we're actually feeding in a noise and if we go and we start making that noise bigger and bigger and bigger then yeah at, at once again if we put about three zeros we're at a scale where we start seeing it able to affect the overall shape uh, having said that, there is some really funky distortion happening on the top here. So I'm not sure exactly what the deal is there. Now, I would think that this is only pushing out in the positive direction. So there's a really interesting... I'm going to actually just keep shrinking this down. I want to visually see what's happening. So maybe actually we don't want to be pushing out on the Y. I think we want to be pushing out on the Z. Yeah, there we go. So I want to put, I was pushing out on Y, but I really wanted to be pushing out on Z because Z is kind of like, it's always the angle that's pushing outward. So let's crank that number up more. So we're getting nice and big. And now back into the random field, back into our scale here, and we can start shrinking the scale down. As we shrink the scale down, we're going to start seeing the variation return. So there we go. Okay, that's really nice variation. Look at these lumps that we're getting. I really like the overall shape of those. Um, that's starting to work pretty dang well for me. Uh, I think I might want to go into the cloner clouds and make them a little bit deeper as well. Yes. And now I think either we just have too many or they're just too big overall. I think, I mean, it's going to be cheaper for us to decrease the amount of them. So let's decrease the number there. Let's decrease our height. We're just going to get slightly fewer of these. And uh, you can see how they are starting to lay out. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they start layering up as we go, so I, I bet we can actually go relatively light on here. So now, yeah, there's starting to be not that many, and that should actually fill up the sky. I mean, when we do our final shot, we're going to be more at an angle like this, and you'll see that those are actually huge in that context. So I'm actually going to hit T for scale on the overall uh, cloud. In fact, I'm going to drop in our random effector here and I'm gonna grab the cloud null and we hit T for scale everything should scale down hopefully uniformly 
Um, so now everything scales down, but kind of properly relative. So now we're getting more of the size cloud that I wanted. And then on our final shot, we can kind of scoot this into position so we can get the overall cloud effect. Or we could always make more. But I think, well, and you know what? There's still too many. Um, so I guess at this point, do we want fewer or just smaller? I guess it's cheaper to go fewer. Okay, too few. Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. Cool. So yeah, now now we get a little bit of spread on those. Yeah, that's looking kind of cool. I like it. Um, now, if we did want these to be low poly, but maybe even a little bit fluffier, we could grab this uh, random, the, the plane effector, and we can have these be pushing it out even more. And you can see when I scaled down everything, it scaled down to Z, so the relative scale was still being maintained. Um, so let's go ahead and start cranking these up even more. So you see they're getting pushed out. In fact, the, the plane effector is only pushing out. Oh, unfortunately, we're not a random effector, so pushing out and in isn't doing anything. So that only goes out, but that does mean we could grab all of our clouds and shrink them down. So the randomness is what's really pushing them out. So that it by itself is kind of fun. You get all these little spikes, but they're very low poly, very spiky. So something that we could do is create a subdivision surface. I'm going to set that to 1-1, one, one, and let's go ahead and drop our entire cluster of clouds in there. So they're still going to be deformed, but then after they're deformed, they're getting subdivided once. And now that they've gotten subdivided once, actually our plane effector is calculating outside of that. So that is also getting deformed. Very important to note. Um, so we'd actually want to, um, just to clean it up, I, I'm going to hit Alt-G on the cloud again. And let's go ahead and make the plane effector a child of that. And now you'll see the different results. It, it's all about when is it getting calculated. So when the plane effector is a sibling of the subdivision surface, that is also getting affected. But when it, it's a kind of a child inside of here, then it's affecting it pre-subdivision. And now this is smoothing out that subdivision. So just kind of important to note. Let's go ahead and grab our fong tags and delete them because I kind of want the spikiness so that, that yeah, these spikes get revealed again and that's more yeah this is kind of what i was hoping for so that's a nice subdivision there quite pleased with that overall i like that uh and then you know and now that we're kind of more seeing the final form we could always go back to our plane factor and we can push this further or less so as i push these out you see the spikes are getting a little bit more emphasized although it is a little bit of a uniform effect yeah you see they just kind of feel like they're getting scaled up uniformly so hmm, slightly peculiar I guess that makes sense on a level. It's not what I was expecting, but it's cool. Uh, okay, cool. So now we got some clouds. And now if this is kind of our forest preserve, we wanted to make a, um, ba -ba -ba -ba, we want to make like a, a little tower to, you know, a, kind of like a forest fire watchtower. I don't know what you call those. But uh, the si I just want to see the proper size. So I think if these are nice big trees, I think maybe if this was about 400, so yeah, uh, let's say 300. So we're gonna go about 300. So I'm going to save this, but copy, to, you know, I'm actually going to cut, so Control X, that cube, Control or Command N to create a new cube. Somebody just says they're properly called Lookout Tower, so good enough for me. Uh, so I'm pasting that cube into this new scene file so we can work on it very quickly. So uh, our grid size is just kind of uh, 300 by 300. So I'm gonna create that. Let's pop it up into the air by 150. So it's sitting right on the ground. Let's make it editable. And let's go ahead and make some very quick geometry here. So I'm gonna hit, uh, grab this top polygon, hit the letter D. And let's go ahead and extrude it up by 300. So I'm gonna hit apply and we'll say new transform, new transform. So we're gonna make that four tall. And then let's hit the letter I for inner extrude to pull it out, and then we're just gonna have some fun with the shape here. So we'll hit I, and we'll hit the letter D, and we'll extrude up a little bit, and then we'll hit I again to go out, and we'll make this like really overhang here. And then we'll hit D for extrude, and we'll push it down a little bit. And we'll hit I for an extrude, and we'll pull out again. And we'll hit D for extrude, and we'll pull up uh, a significant amount, and then I'll hit I for inner extrude, and then D for extrude. And that's gonna be kind of some fencing on the outside, which maybe somebody we'd be standing on. Our scale might be all out of whack here, but I think it'll be visually kind of cool. Um, and then, or do we want that, uh, you know, it'd probably be better if that fencing was its own object. So I'm just gonna do a couple, and then we'll inner extrude in. Yeah, actually we'll do that, and then D extrude down. I inner extrude again, so we'll pull in, and then this becomes the proper kind of building section. So that will be the building. And then we'll hit I for inner extrude, but negative D, I. So we'll extrude that out. And then this will be the roof. So we'll hit 
D for one tiny little extrude there, and then a one big T D for extrude. We'll extrude that way up, and T for scale. We're gonna scale that way down to get this nice little pipe, and then I'm even fine with that square on the end. I'm gonna delete the fong tag so that this is just all hard edge, and now you can see that we've got this overall shape for our watchtower. Um, I think it might be cool if it's not what I had been thinking, but I think it'd be cool if this was tapering out a little bit more. So I'm actually going to do a loop selection right there and hit grow. The shortcut is UY, UY, and there we go. Now I've got all the polygons I wanted. T for scale, scale out, but not on Y. So now I can scale the whole thing up a little bit. And now I want to scale this overall shape, but these subdivisions are getting in the way. So I'm actually going to dissolve those. I'm going to hit the, the line, the edge mode, hit UL for loop. I'm going to select, select, select. Shortcut UD, I thought UD was dissolve, UD is disconnect. Oh wait, there is no dissolve shortcut, I don't think. I guess melt also might work. UZ is melt, uh, but the problem with melt is it leaves behind those points, you see? So I'm actually gonna undo, let's grab those edges. If we hit delete, it'll just kill everything. So what we actually have to do is right click and then go to dissolve. Oh, there's a shortcut for it now, MN, there didn't used to be MN is dissolve, and in this case, it's acting like melt, but without the points. Uh, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and grab this bo bottom polygon, hit T for scale, and I can scale, make sure Y is on, and I can hit T for scale and scale that out. Now you see we get that angle on there, and now we can put our subdivisions back in again. So I'm gonna hit UB for ring selection, MF for edge cut, and I can say apply, don't use end guns, and now we can put as many cuts in there as we want. I think the two gets us back to where we were. So I just wanted that to be proportional. We could have eyeballed it, but we're having fun doing a little bit modeling on this one, so that's fine with me. Uh, cool, I'm going to actually do a loop selection, loop, 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 and now let's triangulate those. I'm gonna say triangulate, so those all get triangulated. They're all in the same orientation, which is pretty much what I wanted. Um, should we do X's or just these angles? I think it's supposed to technically alternate, but I'm fine leaving it like this. Um, so now I'm going to hit I for inner extrude, but I'm going to turn off preserve groups and let's go and do an inner extrude. And now you can see that we get that effect. And now I think I'll probably just hit delete on there. So those get deleted. And now we're left with that overall structure, which is working pretty well for me. Uh, there's some things I would usually do a little bit differently there if I was being careful, because you see that like the thickness here, that is half the thickness of that. So this one's like double thick. Um, so I would probably spend some time cleaning that up and subdividing things differently, but um, that is that is fine. Actually, I just thought of how you would e easily do that. So if we undo there and then we do, actually, I guess it has to be pre-triangulate. -tri I can hit the letter I, don't preserve the groups, shrink them all in a little bit. And that's kind of giving us that extra outer edge. And now we could triangulate. And now when I hit I for inner extrude, now you see that that is that outside part compensates for this inner one. And now if I hit delete that these are more of an equal thickness and already visually, I like the way that looks better. Um, so yeah, that is a really simple way of getting that overall structure there. Now this is probably just going to pass through the ground. So we don't have to worry about too much about this base. Um, and, and we're kind of creating this two dimensional image. So, um, da, 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 da. Like, I, I don't know, I, like on some levels, I'm inclined to scale this up on others. It's like, ah, I'm fine with it. Uh, also, uh, because of the way the polygon, the proportion of the polygon went, like this one's very square and this one's more squat and that one's more squat. So it's almost like this bottom one would s be stretched more, which is, I wasn't thinking about that. Not something to super worry about, but I kind of prefer if those were a little bit each more square. Um, along those lines, be worth it that's eh, fun I'm, I'm i'm thoroughly enjoying myself and i think this type of modeling is is kind of fun to watch so i'm not going to stress so i want to quickly quickly delete everything below here so the quickest way I've, i'm going to be able to do that is because i can't do a loop selection there because it'll do a round but now i can select those rings hit uf for a fill selection fill the top and oops i guess i need to fill that and now i can fill that and now i can hit ui delete the entire bottom and we've got this i'm going to hit uw and it's going to select all of those apparently this is disconnected from that upper part which is strange um, but i'm going to delete that and delete that and now i've got just these bottom ones selected since i've got that i'm going to hit up which is the shortcut for split and then the remaining polygons are still there so i hit delete 
So what happened is I took those polygons. I said, you guys become a new object. Okay, now the old ones that were left behind, delete those. And now those have become a completely separate object. Because I've got that separate object, it should be pretty simple to go and make a cloner, throw in the scaffolding into the cloner, and have each clone be pushed downward. And then we can clone each one to be bigger and bigger and bigger. So let's see if we can get that working. So I'm going to push this visually just kind of back up where it should be. And now those are getting pushed down. But in addition to them each scaling up, I don't know if we can do it via the scale. I don't think the position can be via that scale. We probably have to bring in a step effector. But I'm going to go ahead and just eyeball. Oh, I hope it lets me do each one and doesn't uh, fight me too much on this. It very well might. See, so those those are kind of no. See, it's gonna fight me on it. So even though they're almost, those are really close, you see this one is not quite matching. So that's a little frustrating. I mean, once again, this is like unnecessary extra detail. Um, but okay, so here's what I would actually do here, which is kind of it would be eyeballing it, which I'm fine with. But here I'm gonna say, don't worry about offsetting it. Don't worry about scaling it. So I'm gonna reset those back to their defaults. And now uh, let's even make it four tall. And now I'm going to make a MoGraph effector step effector. And what makes a step effector special is it does them by index. So I'm going to not worry about the scale, but let's worry about the position. And I'm going to start pushing these down. And they're getting pushed down via this spline. I'm going to tell that to be a linear spline. So spline presets, linear. And now you see they're all kind of in a sequence. And I can push them down. In individually by changing the curve there. Um, but um, I'm also going to make a second step effector. So one is going to control scale and one's going to, going to control position. I don't think one could control both. So I'm going to call this one step scale. And it is already controlling the scale and it's a uniform type of scale. So this one is going to control the position. So we need that to start pushing down. And yeah, now you see as they're being scaled bigger, which they're going a little too big. Let's go ahead and make this linear. Uh, they're, as they're getting scaled, we kind of need to change the two of these simultaneously. I'm going to pop out. We'll do that again. So here's our step position, step pause. So I'm going to pop that out as a separate controller so that we can manipulate both of these simultaneously. So um, if we grab our step scale, actually, we're going to need to do the position first. I'm going to start pulling this down. And I want to eyeball it so I'm seeing this top one. And if the top one is working, I'm hoping the bottom ones will as well. I don't know that they will, but let's go ahead and put that right there. It doesn't need to be perfect. I just want it to be pretty dang close. So now the position is there. So now we've got our scale. and. The overall scale is being affected. I'm going to tell it to chill out. It doesn't need to scale that much. It does seem that if we change one, it's going to change the other. But I think I can still eyeball this pretty closely. So at 0.7, seems OK. So I'm going to push this up. And now you can see that there, those two, at least, are pretty dang close. It's going to be a little bit of push and pull between these two. There we go. That seems to match up really nicely. So there we go. Those two are touching now. Unfortunately, you'll see that the next one is not. Um, there might be, I wonder if there's a, a really, there might be a kind of precise one. Uh, pre precise way of doing this, but because I want each one scaled up, you see actually they're lining up really well, but they're lining up really well, but each one is bigger, supposed to be bigger than the one before it, so that's where it's kind of tripping it up, which does probably mean we need to introduce a curve, and unfortunately it's kind of playing between, you know, we have to have these two different ones playing back and forth, back and forth. Um, so unfortunately, uh, well... I, what I'm thinking is it's probably a very mathematical way of making this precise, but instead we're going to have to eyeball these two curves. So uh, by changing this curve, you see how I'm manipulating the way the different ones are being affected. So if I were to grab this, I can shrink them. So I actually would probably want this one to go down, but now that one's going down too far as compared to the other. Um, so yeah, a little, a little interesting there. And now on this one, I'm going to grab this curve and I guess it might be the opposite here. Yeah, so I'm going to push those up more. But you, we have two different curves. And you see how it's kind of like changing one is kind of affecting all the others. So it's, it turns into this like 
iterative push and pull and push and pull. It's very imprecise. I don't like it. It's not, it's pretty clunky. At this point, using this cloner and doing this all manually in, manually is is more trouble than that is actually worth. So at this point, I, I think it would just be better to uh, make man a couple manual copies. So I've got, uh, I'm just going to put an X here because that's kind of an X shape. Um, so what I would do here is probably just, let's position this one very precisely. Well, eyeballed precisely. Let's also grab our axis and I'm going to just move the axis up. If I hit shift C, it should snap pretty well. So I could, uh, if, okay, I'm gonna hit the letter P for snapping. And I'm going to also say edge snap. So now it should be able to snap onto that edge. So now it's very precisely on that. Cool. So now that that's happened, uh, I could make a, uh, we could make a instance of this so that if one updates, they all update. Um, but I think in this instance, I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste it. So we have a second one and I'm going to scoot this down, hit the letter T for scale, scale up and then scoot it up. And then I'm going to copy and paste again. So you see, instead of, instead of doing it that very kind of parametric meticulous way, it's so much quicker to just copy and paste and do this. So now we'll do that final one. We've got it four tall. And you see how much bigger they're getting as they go. But I think that's going to kind of add to a cartoony nature of this. So now you see we got that nice tower. They actually scale. They're working pretty well. Uh, I didn't eyeball super precisely, but we could probably scoot that up a little bit more. And then, because these are all pretty close but not identical, I'm certain I could make a connect object, grab all of them, put them into the connect. And if we increase our tolerance a decent amount, I think that our overall scene is so big that we could probably set that up to like 10. Something we could do is keep on going until we go too far and see when they start welding. You see here, going up to 44 was too much. They started welding to each other. But if I shrink this down, as long as that number is smaller than the smallest connection, but bigger than the way these are connecting, then that has now forced them all to actually weld together and actually become a single model. I'm going to change my fong mode to manual so it loses that fong. And now we've got all of those welded together as if they're one object again. So just copy and pasting them. We also probably could have used deformers. We could have probably done a straight sequence and then used a taper. But like I said, I wanted these to feel very square. So I couldn't think of a good deformation that would actually do all of those simultaneously. But stylistically, I'm, I'm pleased with what we just got there. Now, uh, why don't we parametrically add some thickness here? I'm going to create a cloth surface. Let's throw in our entire, um, you know, X trussing section into the cloth surface. No cloth. I don't want subdivisions, but I do want thickness. Let's push inward. I think that uh, the edges might intersect. You see those are actually passing through each other. I'm completely fine with that in kind of what is happening now. So that is just giving us some thickness on there, and I'm completely fine with those intersecting. It's not going to matter. All right, so that gave us some fun trussing there. Uh, I did want to do some fencing on here. I mean, it's somewhat, uh, how detailed we're getting with this is, is probably a little absurd, but as long as you guys are enjoying it, then uh, we will keep going. Uh, a really quick fence here would be, uh, let's go ahead and make a cube, and I'm going to put it into a null, and then we're going to probably make a couple of cloners. So I'm going to make a... Actually, this is, actually, uh, this is not unusual. I want to... I'm going to just hide the overall shape and let's just do some modeling uh, to make ourselves a fence. So I'm going to make a cloner and I'm going to make a copy of this cube in the cloner. And in that, I'm going to make it a grid array. I'm going to set it to only a height of one and that is Z. I only want X, Y, Z. I only want one on Z. So now we've got that sequence and I can grab that cube, T for scale, scale it way down. And now we can grab the Y and make it really tall. And then we can grab our one box here and then... Let's uh, make it really long, T for scale, scale it down, pull that up, cool. So now, oops, I'm gonna turn off snapping, Shift S, shortcut for that. So now you see I've kind of got this railing, and the reason I'm using the grid array is, instead of the linear, is we can set the width here really easily, and it's symmetrical, and now I can just add in some extra sequences. So there we go, simplest possible railing. Uh, we could go and grab our cube here. That's not the right cube, go and grab our cube here. Make it a little wider. And now I'm just eyeballing it, and we'll make all these a child here. We'll just call this fence. But the reason it's fine to just eyeball this is now we kind of got that overall shape. Now we just drag it up into position. T for scale, and then we'll scale it down now. So I didn't have to worry about being super precise there. I just had to kind of get it approximately where I wanted it to be. 
So there we go. Nice and fat and stylized is pretty much exactly what I was hoping to get. Shrink that down a little bit more. Grab this cube and make it a little bit wider. In fact, I'm intentionally going to overshoot a little bit. And now we can grab that entire fence, make another cloner. Man, I love modeling with cloners. It's so much fun. We could uh, go and put that into a cloner. We're going to make this cloner a radial cloner. <laughs> That's kind of a terrifying little symbol there. Uh, let's go ahead and set it to XZ so it's flat on the ground. We want a count of four, so they're all spinning around. And now we can just set the radius there. And now we move that cloner up into the air until it's exactly where we want it to be. Oop, I kind of accidentally got it exactly where I wanted it. And like I said, I intentionally had this railing overshoot. Uh, I'm going to grab the fence and zero out the Y and Z so it all appears here in the middle. Uh, if I were to grab here, I can actually stretch out that railing to go even further. Or I can pull this in and you know we can just kind of stylistically do that however we want. I guess it looks a little cooler in a little bit. I don't think the Ranger is going to fit through there and fall off. So very simple railing. Now we are going for kind of a low poly thing, but you know what's cool about the setup is we could, if we wanted to, put a fillet on here and we could put some rounding. Even if we are doing low poly, we could go and round this out a little bit by increasing the radius, deleting the fong tag. So you just see we got like a little bit of curvature on there. There's so many details we could apply by adding rounding on here. We could grab our vertical ones and those could be very round. We could even increase that and just make them perfectly round. A lot of options, but in this particular instance, I think these hard edged ones are going to work well. Um, let's go ahead and grab our hit. Actually, this whole building hasn't been saved. So let's go ahead and name this uh, one B lookout tower. And uh, let's go ahead and make a null select all deselect the null make these all children are there. Let's go ahead and rename this lookout tower. Um, let's unhide the ground here. And I just want to throw in some quick windows on this top section. So we've got the, I'm just gonna call that house. Um, we've got these, uh, I want a subdivision here. So I'm going to hit UB, MF, make a cut, it's going to cut two of those that makes us a nice loop. So I can hit UL, I've got that loop, T for scale, or I'm sorry, uh, E for move, move that up in the air, T for scale, scale it up. And now I think I just want some nice big fat windows. So I'm gonna hit, uh, I guess I'll deselect the back one. Ah, I like the big windows. Um, actually, I guess what I'll do is hold down shift while I select edge mode and now it converted all of my polygons to edges. And now if I hit UB, it's ring selection, but I'm gonna actually hold down control or command to deselect that ring. And now you see I'm left with these two loops. I also could have just done two loop selections, but that this would have worked on like a multi segmented thing around like a cylinder. But I get MF again and subdivide those. And now you see I've actually got these extra segments here. So now I can hit, go back to polygon mode. I actually already have the polys I want. And I can hit I for inner extrude, inner extrude these. And then uh, if I want to hit D, get a little inner extrude going and then delete. And now we've got ourselves some nice windows for an interior. Um, I don't think we'd actually see it, but I can hit MD for close polygon hole, and I can just close the hole in there so we've actually got a floor. Um, there's no thickness on these walls. I'm not gonna worry about that. I think that we've got a nice structure here overall. I'm quite pleased with the way that looks. Uh, stylistically, we might go and deform some things or move things things around. We have options to like change the way the roof looks. A lot of that is just stylistic to how we make our the final angle on the building. But uh, I think I'm quite pleased with that overall setup. So let's go ahead and copy our look at tower, save the file, go back into our color landscape here, paste it in and find it. So looks like we are underground, pull it up. Oh, look at that. It looks so cool. Um, so I think a look at tower would be pretty much you'd put it up on a hill right so let's find ourselves a nice hill this is a nice hill love it and in fact i, I kind of like to see the hill behind it so i'm going to pull this a little bit more forward guys i kind of like it intersecting the ground and there being a little bit of a uh, height variation there i'm going to pull this up until just barely we don't see the feet there we go so very pleased with that uh it might hit uh, R for rotate. Let's get a little bit of an angle on there. Yeah, there. I like that. Pull that down. Nice. And now uh, these trees are getting in the way. So I'm going to create a 
what am I going to do? I'm going to go to, we should be grouping these things a little bit better. So we've got our clouds. So that's in the null. We got our lookout tower, but then our ground, and actually the trees specifically, are not in a group. So I'm going to grab the tree null, alt G. I grab the tree cloner, rather. Alt G, grab the effectors that are affecting and put those in. I'm going to rename that trees. And now let's go ahead and select that tree cloner. I'm going to create a MoGraph plane effector. And there's a lot of options we have here. I'm just going to do a very simple one, which is actually we could probably do visibility. If we turn on, actually, I'm not even sure if that's true. Uh, I'm just going to turn on scale. And I'm going to do a uniform scale and say minus one. So that should scale all the trees down to zero, um, unless it's inverting them. Nope, it is scaling them to zero. So it's affecting everything, obviously. But now I can just go and make a, let's do a cylinder cylindrical field and it's right over there i'm actually gonna make that cylindrical field a child of the lookout tower let's shift c psr which is going to put at zero 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 of the lookout tower and now we can pull it back out make a child of the plane just so we know what it's doing i'm going to even call this plane zero and now we just scale up our height and then we'll scale up our radius and i don't want color remapping and I don't want any fall off, so I'll crank that up. And now all the trees that were intersecting our watchtower have been erased. I don't want to visually see that in the viewport, so I'm going to hide it. And you have to deselect it, otherwise it's still kind of on there. So I think uh, that we're looking pretty good there. I'm going to make an instance of our watchtower, and we'll just make it so that there's another watchtower somewhere, just because we'll get some extra free scenery. I don't know how often a watchtower exists in the forest, but... We're going to do that here. So now, uh, essentially, and even where I, where I place this, it's going to be determined by uh, our camera placement. So let's go ahead and make ourselves a camera. And mm, do we want shallow or long? I think, uh, especially if we're going for that kind of two-dimensional poster, I would, I would think that we'd want it to be very uh, flattened. So I'm going to zoom quite a bit. So you can see that we're getting to uh, like a 100 millimeter lens for our focal length. So now it's kind of flattened everything out quite a bit. So now I want to find a nice perspective. Actually, I kind of like having this nice big mountain in the background. Do we want to be, yeah, I think if we're looking up at this tower a little bit. Oh, that's nice. I kind of like it up in this corner. Oh, I like that. Uh, so now that secondary tower, I have to move it. Um, so I'm just moving it and we're going to put it down. Let's see, back. I'm probably going to even trick it to be like way in the background. We'll even lower it a little bit. There we go. So just a little something extra back there. Um, and now we can go and place our trees a little bit. Let's put this plane at zero with the trees because that's what it's affecting. Let's go ahead and grab our clouds. And we can now kind of see where they are. It's going to be hard to move it in that position. So I'm going to move my camera here. You can see... Our camera is looking that way. So I'm going to grab all of our clouds and scoot the entire collection kind of over in this direction. In fact, I'm probably going to hit rotate and spin them so we can kind of get that length. I'm not going to make it perfectly parallel to the camera. And then they're pretty far up, so I'm going to go to move. Let's turn on only Y, and I can start pulling these down. So now we start getting our clouds in our overall shot. So we can either avoid our tower altogether. Look at this. Whoa, look at this. Uh, this, this cloud outline looks like uh, Serenity from Firefly. Um, but um, we could either silhouette the tower perfectly or we could avoid silhouetting the tower. Um, so let's see. I probably want these going even further into the, the distance. So I'm going to go to clouds and I'm actually going to... I'm going to add a one in front of each of these, making it three times the size which means we should do about three times as many clouds. Uh, I guess that we'll just tick this up to 13. We'll tick this up to 12. And I'll just start ticking it up. Tick, tick, tick. Till we get a formation I am pleased with. Kind of like that one. Yeah, I'm going to go back. I just like the look out of these. Um, as I pass through, apparently the plane effector is... Uh, set to some sort of relative position because you see how those are not moving with it. But now we've got some nice big fluffy clouds. Uh, 
I'm going to move this so that the, our tower is a little bit silhouetted. There we go. Uh, that might end up changing, but yeah, you can see our tower has this nice... It's not tangential to it, so that compositionally is helping out. Uh, give that a quick save. And then the last thing is I probably want some extra terrain that's going to be far in the distance. So we can go to our ground. I'm going to copy it. And we're going to make a way bigger one, which is also going to be lower resolution. And uh, let's unlock from our camera so we can go and hit T for scale. And we're going to start scaling this up. It's almost behaving exactly the way I want it to. So the whole thing is scaling up. Um, the height got kind of cartoonishly large, but let's go ahead and chill that out. Um, and I wonder if we can turn off that cylinder here. That's weird. Why did everything turn off? Maybe uh, we have to turn it off in here? Yeah, so if we turn that off in there, it's going to be full power everywhere, which is cool. But actually, we probably do want the cylinder, and then I want that whole bunch of fall off. But what I want to do is actually go to remapping and invert it so it's not affecting the stuff in the center. So now you can see that I've actually shrunk it down, and now the inside part is very calm, and the outside part is the crazy part. Uh, and honestly, I'm probably inclined to make our noise bigger. Yeah, so it's a little smoother. It's getting a little chunky. So now if we go back to our camera angle, uh, we're apparently inside the mountain. Let's go to our top view and see. Yeah, I mean, because we're so flat and zoomed in that we're pretty far away. So we just have to make sure that our cylinder, which is erasing everything out, is maybe a little closer to our... Yeah, a little closer. There we go. Look at that. So our natural hill is kind of terminating right there, but then this bigger, higher poly one is taking over and going further in the distance. So instantly, nice silhouette. I'm going to go ahead and chill out the height a little bit because it's a little tall. Um, and yeah, I'm going to pull it down below the height of our watchtower. But yeah, that's looking great. I, th I thought we were going to have to go through a bunch of random seeds, but like instantly, I love kind of the mountains that we're getting from there. It'd be kind of nice if we... Uh, I mean, I kind of like them being pretty dang tall. Maybe we could uh, grab our camera and rotate it a bit. I'm going to pivot off of our watchtower there a little bit, so we're looking upward a little bit more. Something like that. That's not bad. Grab our clouds once again. Let's see. I'm just trying to get a nice silhouette again. T for scale, scale them all down. And then honestly, uh, I'm going to rotate them more this orientation because we want, I'm seeing a lot of uniformity here. I might uh, grab our random, that's random rotation and scale. Did we not have a positional one? This one we did. Uh, okay, well, let's add on a positional one. So let's add on a MoGraph random plane effector, and we're going to just call this one position. And let's go ahead and grab our positions here. I don't want it on Y. Oh, that, why did I make it plane? I wanted random. Whoops. Um, MoGraph random. There we go. I'm going to call this random position. So now we can change the, I think it's X. Or was it the, a little hard to tell. We're such a huge scale. Yeah, okay, it was X. So we don't really need those. I think there was a Y position. We might have grouped it someplace incorrectly. We're dealing with such big numbers. But anyway, um, we can probably just start clicking a random seed here until, ooh, not, not bad. Okay, I'm going to copy that seed because I it's not bad. Ooh, I like that one better, though. Okay, uh, random seed, but I like this open space here. It's a little bit calm. Uh, and then the reason I rotated our clouds to be facing this direction is there's a general direction that they're facing. And by rotating it this way, it's kind of lending to our composition a little bit so that there's more of an angle heading, bringing the eye to the watchtower, which is our focal point. If we want to fake it even a little bit more, we could grab the overall clouds and tilt it. So it's kind of, you know, 
tilt those up a little bit and now the angle is even more so pointing here i'm going to scoot these a little bit because i didn't want that point to be touching that railing but there we go now our tower is nicely silhouetted we've got our clouds everything's kind of got a nice direction um the one thing that we could potentially do would be fake some trees on these distant mountains but i'm not sure if that's something we want to do it's funny how few of the clones of the trees we're actually seeing, considering how many clones we made. Also, something I noticed is our tree trunks are not quite making it to the ground because we're cloning right onto that surface. So I might go into our trees, and there's only four, so I'm going to click cylinder, 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 and we can just uh, take uh, X times two. See, X worked there. Um, I guess numb makes sense if you're multi, I don't know. But uh, by I, we can make those quite tall, and now it's sticking through the ground, and it's going up through the tree, but we wouldn't see those parts anyway, so it just kind of worked. Um, and then, uh, do we want to deform the trees? I mean, there's so many of them. But I was thinking about adding in some deformation on the trees so that they all get a little bit warped. I'm going to save it, and let's see what happens. I'm going to do a displace deformer this time just to see what happens. Displace deformer... Um, Let's, I'm going to go overboard, so we'll do 555. Let's make a noise. Oh, it, okay, it's running nice and quick, so we will do it. Uh, intensity centered is fine. Let's start with... Actually, we'll just slowly scroll this up and see what we end up with. Uh, ba, 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 ba. They get kind of ugly, to tell you the truth. Like, I don't like what they're doing, so scratch that. Okay. Cool. So now we've got our overall landscape. I think we're done with our modeling part. Let's save this as number two or as number A, B, C. So it's going to be one C. And now let's actually see if we get some texturing. So we're actually getting to the part where we're referencing um, the, what the original question was. So uh, let's go ahead and start with a gradient. I think we'll just turn on the... Do we turn on the Lumens channel? Honestly, I think maybe we'll do it in the color channel. So let's start out real generic here. I'm going to just make a gradient, and it's black to white currently. Let's start out with the clouds. I think that's going to be a straightforward place to begin. So if we go to our clouds, just apply this. We've got a couple things we can do. First of all, we could just apply it to the clouds like this. Now there's going to be some random gradients in there. But... Because we didn't really spin the clouds around, I want them to kind of have a flat projection. Now, what we could do is turn this onto a frontal projection. And what's happening is this single gradient is being applied from one end to the other of the screen. There's actually something kind of powerful about that, where you can kind of control the overall fall off on it. So it's almost like they're darker nearby. Or we could take this and set it to a gradient V. And now it's dark in the bottom and it's getting darker as it goes up. So I could actually grab this and pull it up through the air. And you can see it actually gets darker in the back and lighter as it goes up. So there's something kind of neat about that. Um, and we might want to do some sort of overlay on top of it to make that happen. But I think, especially if we're following the inspiration, um, there's more of a... Uh, and the clouds aren't... Well, I guess the cloud over here. I, actually, it's probably a tree. But you know, this cloud happens to be flat here. But... I think that there's a lot of repetition in the gradients if we're emulating that a little bit more closely. So along those lines, what my thought is, is we would go into our individual shapes here and apply the gradients. So let's go ahead and make sure it's a full application of it. And uh, I'm going to temporarily just yank these other trees, out, these other clouds out. So we're only getting clones of the one. So my thought is, is if we take this and we say not a frontal projection, but a flat projection, and then we grab our uh, our texture axis mode, and then we hit T for scale. Make sure we got our object, and we start scaling up our flat projection. Then we can get individual mappings of this projection on each cloud. Now let's see the way it's being projected. So we're kind of projecting. Okay, yeah, we're projecting pretty flat there. I'm actually fine with that. Let's go ahead and set this to U and see what we're getting. And that's actually what's kind of cool is like we're mapping onto this original shape here. So we don't have to map onto the big long cloud. We only have to map onto the generic initial cloud, which might explain why some of the scaling was a little bit funky. But you can see how they are now being mapped. Now, that is cool. That's a good start. Let's go back over here and I can see each cloud is kind of a full gradient from black to white. 
but there's a lot of additional detail, especially because this is in the color channel. So if I were to hit render right now, you're going to see that we have all of this definition in them. That's way too much detail. So, uh, and also let's make a sky and let's go and make a sky gradient. In fact, I'm going to copy that material. Let's rename this one sky. And this one can be a nice straightforward gradient, I think. And, um, uh, we're going to go a little bit more colorful with ours. It won't be quite so stylized with color. Let's go into our gradient. We're going to make it nice blue. And it can go lighter, but I'm going to steal a middle color there. Let's pull that over. And I guess make this one darker, a little less saturated. And eh, it can go lighter. So uh, that's going to be a sky gradient. We apply that here and I'm going to set it to be a frontal. So it's going to project frontal. Also, another important thing is when you're setting the frontal, uh, your composition is very important. So if we went to our render settings, command B, setting up our overall resolution here would be a good idea. So if we were to uh, kind of set this to a nice sort of uh, widescreen, let's see. Um, I don't know, let's do a 920 by, one twenty. So you see how it gets framed? I think I might want even wider. What's the more wide format? It's the 16, nine. Let's do it. Let's just type in 16. Let's type in nine. Lock the ratio. Oh yeah, they can't go above that. Um, so we go 16 times two. Wait, why don't we do this? Let's just do uh, 1600 by 90. Oh, unlock the ratio, 16. Cool, now we lock the ratio, and now we add a zero. Uh, and then we'll do a times two, why not? Boink. Okay, so nice huge image. But the point being is the ratio is locked to that image, so our frontal projection is automatically mapping to whatever that square ratio is. So now we can actually see where that is grayed out. We can actually frame our viewport there. I always like framing my viewport to it. I don't like seeing the black bars. I think it's still a little deceptive to your eye, so I like framing it perfectly. So this is kind of our final composition here. Anyway, now you can see the way our sky is projected frontally. Uh, if we wanted to, we can go inside of this particular material and we could add in some angle so we could rotate this a little bit, you know, depending on how we want it to be. I think maybe a little darker on the bottom. And now based on the way that is, I can pull these up because we're not quite seeing it. So yeah, a little darker back there. All right, I like that. And now I, clearly our illumination is coming from the right. So it's working pretty well for our clouds. Having said that, now we've got this cloud background. We can jump back to the way these clouds are being applied. The clouds are getting that material applied. Um, and our, that material is, let's go ahead and name it clouds. That material is, uh, it is in the color channel. I'm going to temporarily turn off reflectance. And let's go ahead into the entire cloud and all. I'm going to right click and I'm going to add a Cinema 4D compositing tag. And I'm going to say it's a composite background. Effectively, what that means is it's going to treat the color channel as if it was the luminance channel, but with some advantages. So now if I hit render, those are actually going to appear as completely flat. They're behaving as if we put the luminance channel in there. But where that gets interesting is if we turn our reflectance channel back on again, and let's add in some some specular on here, and I render, they should be, well, let's see. I'm going to make a light. Let's move the light kind of into the generic direction that the clouds were going to be receiving their light. In fact, we got to go pretty far because we're seeing far into the clouds. And then those that would have to be way high up in the air. So I'm going to copy however far we moved over on Z and put it up on Y. So that's moving them all up. So let me see if it does it now. Okay, uh, I thought we'd be seeing more of a specular here. I'm going to really crank up the height. Does, uh, I thought that, Uh, I thought that applying it this way would still enable the specular to come through. Am I wrong in that? Yeah, look, there's no specular. Da, 
da 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 so uh why i thought yeah i thought the speculator would come through i'm not sure what i'm missing maybe uh maybe reflectance doesn't come through on that even though i thought it did so i guess a quick alternative is drag this gradient into our luminance channel and if we turn that on and then we get rid of this compositing tag well, now we can turn off the luminance. Is that, Okay, you see now the specular is going through on top of the luminance. So a little bit backwards from what I thought. But anyway, the point here being is we can feed this gradient through. And it looks like we have to scale up a little bit because we're missing a little tail right there. So T for scale, I should be able to scale it up here. Oop, go into the proper setting. Scale it up. There we go. Just enough to catch the tips of those so now we get this luminance property but we also get a little bit of low polyness popping through i think that's kind of cool um now uh, as an alternative if i were to turn off this subdivision surface now we just get back to these polygons something that m might be fun would be and we're just kind of exploring things here so now we've seen the way we could map it globally with a frontal projection and we've seen how we can map the overall individual clouds and it looks like i still have to scale that t for scale a little bit more um another thing we could do is yeah let's try i can make that editable and i'm going to select all of our polygons of that object. So remember, it's just this kind of globby guy back there. And now I'm going to go to the a different startup layout. Instead of the layout startup, I'm going to go to body paint UV edit. And now we can actually see the UVs of our object. So if I were to switch over to our actual UVs here, I think if I, how do we make that actually happen? We are working on that. Oh, okay. So this is important. I have my object and that object is editable. I grab its UVW tag and I drag it into this window and now we're actively seeing those UVs. So I can grab each individual UV. So you can see the way that it would be projected if we set this to UVW. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to our commands and I'm going to say I want max UV. And what max UV does is it takes every single individual polygon and it takes it and it maximizes it on the entire canvas. But what we just did is we said every single little polygon on top of this entire cloud, you're in for yourself. You don't care about any of your neighbors. So what this translates to, if we go back to our startup layout, is if we change our material instead of being projected flat, being projected in our UVW, every single polygon is getting their own version of the projection that we just had. And that's pretty interesting. Um, now, visually, I think this is gonna end up being a little overwhelming. So um, you can see how it gets this really cool, you know, we've got a pretty cool pattern there and I'd almost think we want to be even lower poly count if we were doing that. Uh, and what happens if we subdivide that? Uh, well, it gets, it kind of rounds them out, which is actually kind of interesting. But we've got that. It's really overwhelming. So we'd have some options on top of that. So one of them would be, I'm actually going to, I want my other tag back again. So I'm going to copy this shape, undo, undo, undo. Oop, no, don't paste. Undo, 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 undo. Now we're back to our other projection type. And I can paste this in. And I'm going to steal that tag back. So I actually have both of those tags. So what I could do is we could have a second instance of our cloud material. So here's our flat one. And you can see that this is the one that's selected. So what I could do is put like an alpha or a transparency on here. I could make it partially transparent. So now um, this one is a partially transparent fl uh, flat projection. This is transparency. Okay, so that's completely not there. Oh, interesting, it's overriding it. So not transparency, we have to do alpha. So under alpha, I'm going to feed it a color channel and if we were to make it black, it should be completely transparent. But if we do it partially there, then we're going to partially see one projection and partially see the other. Oh, now look at that. Now, if I were to crank this up all the way, uh, and sorry, I should have the slider on the screen, you can see. Uh, if I, in my alpha channel, if I keep on cranking up my color channel here, 
we are fully seeing this flat gradient. If I pull it all the way down, we're fully seeing that gradient. But if I mostly pull this over, and we're actually in decent playback in the viewport as well, you can see that we're getting our overall gradient, but also the tiny little individual ones as well. And each of those is their own little gradient. And visually, that's what I was hoping for. That I like that. Um, so I think I'll actually probably leave it like that. Um, so yeah, cool. I like that. Uh, and uh, this is the overall one. I'm thinking I might spin our luminance channel around a little bit, make it based a little bit more off the bottom. Yeah, so they're a little darker down there. Um, so yeah, okay, so that is a projection on the clouds for that gradient. So let's go ahead and do some similar things on our trees, perhaps. So let's go ahead and do a quick save. So we got clouds one. I'm going to call this clouds... Um, I don't know. Well, I'm just going to call that the clouds overlay. Naming these is going to be very important. But let's worry about our... <sighs> Should we do the same technique on the mountains? I think so. Let's go ahead and copy both of these gradients. And then uh, I wonder if... Yeah, it looks like we can change both of them simultaneously. So let's go ahead and make ourselves some very chilled out green mountain tops. Okay, nice. And essentially, we want the exact same layout. So I'm going to go and uh, we're going to steal those texture tags. I'm just going to make a copy on the cloud so I can get to them. And now we can add our two different types of ground. Let's go ahead and Alt G. We'll group those. And now we can apply both of them there. And now let's replace the first one with the first one and the second one with the second one. And let's rename this um, ground. And let's rename this one ground overlay and now those are both applied and now right now the way it's projected is it's uv mapping so it's just mapping the uvs so if i hit render it's going to be kind of this interesting like just repeating if we want the low poly version then we're going to have to make it ed these editable so why don't we do that um i guess it's saved in the previous version but eh, why not i'm gonna save another copy hard drives are cheap uh, I'm going to grab both the grounds, make them editable. Um, okay, it's visually disappearing in the viewport because of the way the texture overlays, but it is still there. That's why I hit render and it appeared. Um, okay, so we need to do the same thing. So let's go to our UV layout, UV edit. Keeps on popping on the other screen. Uh, now I want to make sure I've got the ground selected. I'm going to go ahead and drop in our UV layout. And now we can select our... Okay, select all. What is it doing? Why is it? Okay, there's being a little weird, but uh, control A, command A, seem to do it. Max UV. Boom, they're all maxed out. And now let's do it for our other one. Drop that one in. That should be the one we're now controlling. Make sure it's selected. Select all. Max UV. And now all the UV should be super big per polygon. And now, I guess we can just hit render from here and make sure it's working. Um, honestly, not as different as I thought it would be. Um, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, now, uh, having said that, something that might be kind of cool is if we go to our, if we de-link from our camera and we see more of a perspective shot here, and let's go to polygon mode and select both of our mountains. So this kind of flattens them out, so it's going to be a little bit hard. But what I'm thinking is what if we start randomly selecting some of our polygons? It's a little hard to tell exactly what we're going to see, but I know that over here is kind of the area. So I'm going to add some in, erase some out, add some in, erase some out, hopefully get a little bit of randomness there. And now if we switch back over to the other type of UV, I think those continue to be selected, which means I should be able to do things like, like rotate them or change our projection type. So if I go back to this view here, oh, I guess if we relink to our camera, right now if I hit render, you'll see it's exactly the same. But I think it's only going to take my currently selected one. So let's change some of these to frontal, which you see what it does over here on this projection. And yeah, it, look, it only did the ones I currently had selected. So now I hit render, the ones that are UV should be overlaid in a really interesting way. Honestly, some of this overlaying, um, I hope I wasn't making too much of a nuisance there because 
uh, I just remembered that the way this is overlaying, this flat one, this flat projection is very different. So we almost shouldn't be trusting what we're seeing there. So I'm going to temporarily say don't apply. Just type in some number there. So now this one isn't applying at all. So now this is what our projection was doing. So that actually already looks pretty dang cool. Like I like the way the ones we just remapped projection wise, like those are looking, I like the randomness of the gradient. It's pretty good. Um, I'm inclined to uh, grab these polygons here a little bit differently. Hard to select them because of uh, the way they're laid out, but I'm kind of confident that we could just current state to object this and uh, then get that to be the permanent UVs. The only trick might be that, uh, yeah, so that this is now editable and permanent, and let's do it on the other one. And now it's going to probably wreck our trees. We could keep the original there and just hide it. Uh, call it tree ref. Uh, otherwise, we'd have to relink the, the tree. But I, I think it's fine to do it this way. But now we should be able to select this ground as well. And now we can grab some of our polygons here. And now we can just grab some of those random ones and change the way those are projected. So we can go back to our, da, 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 back to our UV edit. Dink. Dink. And then say frontal projection. And now you see those get frontally projected. And now if we hit render here, look, we get these nice patches laid out. But we, of course, have the option of clicking on the move tool, which is that one. And I can move this. It's not going to let me. Come on. I've got them selected. Oh, we have to go into this other polygon mode. Now I can move them. So now as I move this, look, you can even see it right there in my viewport. As I move it, it's catching different parts of the gradient. So I could be like, okay, I want these to be darker. And I could grab a different selection of polygons. And then I could say that, yeah, these should be a different selection. In fact, I'll even select that one. And I can say, yeah, these should also be frontal. But I want these to be frontal and moved to a lighter section. So we could actually be very artistic with the way we place these. We could grab the highlighted parts of the mountain and move it into the lighter area, and the darker parts of the mountain and move it to the darker area. It's actually pretty dang powerful. I've never tried art directing UVs in this way, but that would be pretty neat. I like this little bit of randomness around, but we are very distinctly controlling the way those look. In addition to that, I'm moving that little cluster of polygons darker and lighter, but we can also go to scale and scale those up. And now just this patch is going to be more affected by the darkness to lightness. If we go too far, if we go outside the grid, it's gonna loop around, but that's working pretty well. I'm pretty happy with that. Back to polygon selection. It's just easier to go to the actual polygon tool here and we can make you know, more of a selection. Uh, we can go and select polygons a little bit easier. So I'm gonna grab that cluster here and then let's frontal project those. They're a new cluster and now I could move those distinctly into the lighter area. So those should be very light. And I should be able to just select this one. I don't know if there's a select connected. UW, oh, it works. It didn't used to, uh, but they upgraded so that if you're in the UVW tool, I can use my keyboard shortcuts. So I was able to grab all those. I'm gonna hit T for scale, scale those down and then i just want this entire cluster e for move i want this entire cluster to be a little darker cool that is awesome okay so that's working so well why don't we spend a second and do it on the mountain as well so i'm gonna go ahead and oh we need our other uv so that would be this one drag that on so let's go ahead and select this which should be a nice big light part of the mountain and let's go ahead and projection frontal E for move, and let's move this to the lighter section. Oh, that's so awesome. Look how art directable this is. Uh, actually, these are also kind of curved in a way that they should be seeing the front of the mountain a little bit better. So let's say frontal again. I'm gonna move those, not quite as light, but pretty light, so around the middle. And this is a little bit more of a shadowy area. Maybe not those, but these should be. Definitely those, definitely those. So let's go ahead and do a frontal projection there. And then we're going to move all these down to the darker areas. Um, so that is working awesomely. I am quite pleased with that. We got a little bit of randomness in some of the other ones. Honestly, I'm completely fine with that. I'm not going to worry about every tiny little one. But it's a simple, you know, if we wanted to continue here, I could, actually, I guess that's the other one again. We drag that over. I could grab, you know, we could grab the lighter side of the mountain. Frontal, actually, I mean, it's so easy. We can just go and scoot that. And we can go and grab the darker side of the mountain. 
Awesome. And then once again, frontal projection. Move it down a little bit darker. Uh, and then, you know, and if you want to still get that appearance of a gradient, just make sure you scale them up a little bit. So that's a little darker. Um, awesome. So quite pleased with that individual gradient. Now, if you're matching this a little bit more, I'd be uh, maybe grabbing a little bit more rectangles or we could use a knife tool and cut between the different shapes so we could get more of a soft transition instead of these very polygonal shapes. But what we're getting, quite pleased. Okay, let's move on to some of our other shapes. Um, I mean, honestly, along these lines, it goes to making a lot of these editable because we kind of get this almost like painterly thing that we have control over now. So what this is making me inclined to want to do would be back to our startup layout. And now let's give that another quick save. And now we've got all of our trees. And what I, I'm actually kind of thinking, which might be a little bit crazy, um, is making this like editable and well, combining them all to a single shape, and then we could just grab individual polygons and color them that way. Um, so I just don't want to lose the tree trunk separately. And once we make it editable, I don't think there's a way to fix that unless they we made two. If I make a copy of this cloner and we delete all of the cones out from one, and then on the other, we rescue the cones. So I've got one cloner that's only got stumps and the other cloner that has the treetops. And since they're both identical, we're getting all of them. And now I should be able to put that into a connect object. Don't weld. And then put that into a connect object. Don't weld. Um, didn't like the connect object so much. Let me just go ahead and make that editable and then make that editable and then do the connect objects. No, why is it not liking the connect object? Well, making them editable is fine. Can I select children, right click and say connect and delete? No. Are these, oh, they're instances. Yes, yes, okay. So I'm going to undo. The reason it didn't like what we were doing there, I'm going to undo, 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 undo. Okay, the reason it didn't like what we were doing is because we have our cloner set to multi-instance. So I'm going to go ahead and save it because this is slightly dangerous. Uh, I'm going to set those back to normal instances, which means they're just straight up copies. And now our connect, that now you see they didn't disappear. So now, and because they're so low poly, even that was running pretty quick. So now I've made them editable and now we've got one object that is tree trunks and one that is trees. So these are the trunks and these are the trees. Because we've kind of gotten into this artistic phase of it, like we're making things editable, but in this particular instance, it seems to be working pretty well. Um, so let's go ahead and do the trees as well. So let's go ahead and grab copies of the ground and let's go ahead and rename this tree. And we'll go ahead and rename this one tree overlay and let's go ahead and change both of their gradients double click grab it go over here go into the gradient uh we're gonna start out with a really deep rich green and then we'll shift over to another very rich green in fact i'll pull this up a little bit just to distinguish it's a little bit neon we will change it i'm almost certain uh let's go and replace oh, all right let's go ahead and apply these and apply let's keep in mind that our overlays have been currently disabled and we do have to go turn those on but um now we've got our trees uh in fact i want to make our because we're art directing these what would be kind of cool is you would make you would go way overboard so you'd make them like a a very dark area and then a very medium and then a very light area and then once again just to uh, uh we could do turbulence as well if we wanted but i'm going to add some angle in to get that little slight downward lighting-esque thing. So now, now that we've got that, we've got once again our UVs. So we want, and actually the way they're overlaid on themselves right now is pretty cool. Um, and this one is disabled. I don't trust it. So I'm gonna pull it off of it and we'll put it back on eventually. But right now we're just dealing with the UV one. So based on that, if we go back to UV edit, 
and we go to our trees and we drag in our tag then we can see okay this is the way it's laying out all of our uvs here uh andy yeah sorry andy I, I, i've got two monitors up and sometimes i forget that the the material editor popped up on the other monitor so i'm trying to keep it in the main one but sorry for that um Anyway, uh, bu, 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 bu. okay, uh, I want to, I've got all of these. I want to go to my UVs. I want to select all. Let's go over here to our UV polygons. And I'm going to set it to, I guess, all be frontal. So we got a big frontal projection over all the entire thing. But now we can go and artistically grab all of, and then we probably would have to shrink our selection here. Yeah. Oops, don't want to lose our camera view. If I hold down shift and I middle mouse button click and start pulling left, my cursor will get smaller. So what we could do is start going through and selecting a little bit meticulously all of the tree sides that are facing the light. I mean, honestly, it wouldn't take that long. I don't know how interesting this is going to end up being on a stream, so we don't want to spend too long on it. But we'll select a couple of these, especially over here on the light side of the mountain. So let's grab these and maybe that one, maybe that one, that one, just the ones we're seeing. So I'm going to grab all those and I guess those. Okay, that's as many as we'll do. And okay, and then I'll grab a couple that kind of stand out over here. And now we're going to say frontal again. I, I guess we didn't even need to, but now I can grab the move tool. I'm going to move all these up to the lighter area. And then... So that worked well. We can also shrink them so they all go lighter. We can also scale them all up so that they're all overlaying a little bit more. But then we could go and grab the darker. I mean, it, the frontal flat projection is already kind of overall doing a pretty cool effect there. But we could go and grab some of these darker sides. And if we want to put some emphasis on them, if I go to move and I start moving them backward, you see how all the ones I've selected are getting darker. So we could a little bit randomly go through and grab darker sides and just be like, okay, that one, and then this one's going to be super dark, so you just scoot all those down and over. And honestly, to a degree, uh, it would be nice to, like, randomly just select some over here. So, like, just some of those will move over, and then it'll just be a little bit lighter. They'll, they'll stand out a little bit more. And then we can go and grab some of these, where it's like just that one, just this one, just that, that, that. We don't want all these to be identical. So, you just do that, and I'll just make all those a little bit, oops, uh, I'll make all those a little bit darker, and or maybe even a little bit more, a little bit darker. And then over here, I'll grab that one, that one, these, there, there, E, and then we'll move those. Okay, those are already as light as they can be, so we'll just move all these and move them lighter. Just some highlights over there, so you see we're very specifically being able to direct how these go. And then also, let's keep in mind, and when these start overlapping, if these go too far over, I guess these are, yeah, these are the ones that are out of the scene because all of these are the ones that were in the scene. But um, we also potentially could just click here in the viewport, and you see I'm actually grabbing those as well. We could grab these and start scooting them a little bit lighter. We also have the option of grabbing them and scaling them higher or bigger. So if I have T for scale, as I scale them up, they're going to be eating more of the individual gradient. As a blatant example, because this, like, let's grab these. These are all eating up, a, like, a lot of our viewport. So if I had T for scale and scale them up, if I make sure all of them are over here, we can make them so that they individually have a lot more of a gradient because they're bigger. So anyway, that's pretty cool, uh, like being able to art direct these UV maps this way. It's not really something I'd ever considered. So I think that's enough tinker around with those trees. Uh, we can do the same thing on the tree trunks. Um, we didn't actually make a tree trunk material yet. I guess we'll do that. I mean, we're kind of seeing this one all the way through and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. So let's go back to standard. And then I'm going to grab those two materials and let's rename this one trunk. Rename this one trunk overlay. And we'll grab both of them again. Pop open the material manager, make sure it's on the correct screen. Go into the gradient. And now let's go ahead and go nice and warm brown. And we'll go over here, nice and warm brown. And if, you know, something I realized is, I, especially as kids, you think of bark as very brown, but bark is actually mostly gray. Like, if you look at a tree, like, it's it's gray. It's not brown. Maybe the tiniest hint of brown. But anyway, um, we will steal these materials. 
onto the tree trunk. Replace it. And replace it. I mean, along those lines, I guess these should be directly on the tree. Tree. And now we're back to our tree trunks. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure the best way of overlaying that one. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fine just letting it do what it's doing. Those are not uh, the most important parts. So let's just get our tower finished up. Uh, and in here, I think we can do something pretty fun. Um, let's see, what's a good way of doing this? I'm going to may really pare down these objects so that we only have a couple layers. This should be cool. I'm going to, yeah, we've already got our cloth surface. I'm just going to make that editable. So that just becomes our truss. And then we've got our house. And then we've got our railing. So we'll throw that into a connect, make it editable. We'll just call this railing. So three objects, that's all we're worried about. Um, so my thought is if we were to take our all of our truss and then we go into, uh, I guess we need, we do need some that stands out here. So I'm going to duplicate this wood and let's call this uh, um, tower. And we'll call this one tower overlay. Once we start kind of doing the overall scene, I think we'll be bringing back our the, the overlays, but for right now, we're just not worrying about them too much. Uh, open them up. Go over here. This one, I think we will make it decently brown. We'll saturate this up a bunch. And we will still leave it pretty light. But we'll saturate that up a bit as well. Cool. So that becomes our tower. So now we apply those same materials again. I think the overall is fine. Replace and replace. Um, even by default, that's neat looking. Um, but, uh, and then this tower should be on the lookout tower. What happened to it? Oh, there it is. Hello, little tower. I do want that tinier, so I'm going to scale it down. The only way to scale it down is uh, by going to object mode. So I'm going to shrink it down. And we'll rotate it. Yeah, so it's a little bit more dead on. Uh, and then back to model mode. I don't like being on object mode. Uh, unless you have to be, it's a, you can break scaling issues. Uh, okay. Now we can go back to the way these are going. So now, um, I'm going to take, uh, what's the most important one. Let's take the truss. I guess the truss is the most important one. Let's go to our UV layout, UV edit. Boop. And let's go ahead and throw our truss in and let's go and select all. Go to our UV edit, and I'm going to set it to frontal. And now you see we got our overall frontal projection working well. We can get a T for scale, and we can scale it up. But then we also have our – where where's the tool? Oh, here's the tool. We can turn on – that's scale. Keep clip coordinates. Where's, where's non-uniform scale? Is that still a separate tool? Oh, yeah. Uh, we can click here and say non-uniform scale. A little bit of a pain. But we can click on non-uniform scale, and now I can go whoop and really widen it out because I want to eat as much of this gradient as possible. So, yeah, that is good. Now, what I'm thinking is we do want to offset these. We don't want to say single flat gradient the entire thing. So if we go back to our polygon mode, let's go to our selection. And now I should I'm gonna click, click, and then it's going to be a little sloppy. But let's go ahead and do that, 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 that. Cool. Actually, that worked pretty well. So now we've got those. Uh, and now if I were to grab that, hit E for move and move all those oh, back to the UV mode, move all these to the right, then now they've become brighter and disjointed from the other part. And now uh, this will be the most difficult part to select. But if we go to our top view and I'm going to go back to polygon selection mode and let's go back to our selection. Right now it's on. It's not on tolerant selection which means we want to be careful to intentionally overshoot by a little bit. So now my hope is that we are selecting everything that's in the back. It's a little hard to tell, especially like these don't almost seem, those don't seem like I selected them and I want, I very much want to make sure I did select them. So um, I'm going to intentionally overshoot again. Did we get them? A little hard to tell. Seems like we did. But now let's go back to the UV edit version. And now if we take all of those and start scooting them to the right, it's going to make those all 
darker. Um, I do need to go back to our non-uniform scale. I'm going to scale all these a little bit tighter so I can scoot them all into the darker range. And then actually, I think I want them quite dark. So I'm going to hit T for scale, scale them down, non-uniform scale, scale them quite pinched and honestly pretty low. So we can pull it down into this darker range because those should be disappearing into the darkness a little bit. So uh, hopefully that is working well. I might have grabbed some extra ones here. Uh, I'm just not going to worry about it because that's good enough. Uh, let's grab the house. We'll essentially the same technique. Select all. Uh, frontal projection. Um, I want it to eat up a bunch of the space, so T for scale. Non-uniform scale. Make sure we're on the UV edit version of it. E for move. Move it over. Mostly in the light. And then I'm just going to eyeball. We're just going to grab the darker side of here. That should be a little bit more in shadow. Pretty much everything here on the bottom. So those there, and then probably even those two on the underside. Good enough. And I'm going to just move these down to the darker section, so they're a little bit darker. And now, finally, we've got the railing. Grab the railing, pull that in. Make sure it's selected. Frontal projection. There's our railing, T for scale. Scale them up. Uh, this one might just be a little bit more fun to be able to make it just match the overall shape. Non-uniform scale. Let's go ahead and have it eat up as much of the overall projection as possible. There we go. Very nice. I like it. And oh, so in this viewport, or yeah, let's just deselect the object. And then let's go back to, oops, I minimized. Pardon. Ba, ba, ba. Back to startup. Back to the proper viewport. Nice. And we see that the we've developed a new technique for doing this tower that we didn't have when we were doing the uh, the clouds. So I honestly, I think the clouds look worse now. Let's go and do a quick render. And here's where we're currently at. This is what the overall shape is. And you can see how the lighting that we're getting, because we're, we're manually kind of lighting this with a gradient, which is pretty interesting. Um, what this is making me want to do is make sure that our cloud overlay, I don't want to go back and UV edit those. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, I don't want to control those. So what we're going to do is um, make the material over here. I'm just going to make sure our alpha is a little bit, actually, I guess we want to go up. So it's mostly that overlay one. So yeah, almost entirely that. And we could probably chill out our uh, specular as well. So we're going to say, yes, a little bit of specular, like a little bit of break up there, but not too much. Um, OK, so now we've got we've now essentially lit this with UVs, which is cool. I like that. Um, now we are using the luminance channel. Um, let's see, what do I want to do? Uh, I think I want to get rid of the specular in a lot of these. So I'm going to grab all of these channels. And let's just try turning off our specular entirely. So I'm going to turn off the reflectance channel. Now you see it's a lot more pure in the color. You see like our UV is a soft gradient traveling across, except for the ones we chose to highlight. Flattens everything out quite a bit, but in a way, that's kind of what we're going for. Uh, I like that. And now uh, we, did, we did make our uh, clouds. We yanked out our other little clouds. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just put these back in again and hope that the uh, way the UVs are applying is going to make them all look pretty similar. Um, might need to put this on them each individually. Yep, apparently so. Okay, that's fine. I'm not going to worry about it. Let's just put our variation back in again. Um, now, we did mess up one of our trusses over here. I could go back and fix it. I feel like fixing that would probably be a good idea. Um, we have already used up our full two hours on this, and I was planning on whipping through a bunch of questions. But this was a fun one. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. But now we're kind of in the place where we could start stylistically adding in some additional things here. So I'm going to go ahead and, first of all, on our overall clouds, I think making them lighter is good. We don't need to go all the way black. So let's go ahead and grab this and start uh, making this a little bit lighter. There we go. So those are nice and light down there. Now, something I think would be very cool would be making in our render settings. Let's go ahead and turn on physical, and we're going to add in ambient occlusion. And now that this is not present in the other thing, but you know we're not trying to recreate the other one super faithfully. Um, so uh, our default scale is still around 200. So this default ambient occlusion might be fine. Let's hit render. 
and see what we get. Now we're getting some fun addition of detail in some of these spots, but some of it's getting a little bit ugly. So let's see if we can get away with it at all. What I want to do is make our ray length really big because I want, I don't want these tiny little harsh areas. I want big soft ones. In addition to that, I don't want it to go black. Why don't we make it go blue? We'll get some blue in there. So it's just kind of adding in this little bit of shadow. Now that's okay. Like I kind of like it down here. It would have to be darker. Um, but we really have to soften these up. So we have to go into our physical settings and crank up some of our different settings in here. In fact, progressive is generally a good idea. And uh, ambient occlusion, that's the one we want more detail on. So let's hit render. So it's going to kind of progressively increase and increase and increase. I like the way, look how it kind of add, it kind of makes all the definition pop a little bit in the trees. Like if they're placed on the ground a little bit better. I like that. I don't like it so much in the trees. Um, I'm pretty sure we can go to the clouds and add a compositing tag and say don't see by ambient occlusion. Yeah, and now it's ignoring the, the those. Good, good detail. I like that. I like this little bit of separation. Um, so we still get our gradient, but get that little hint. And now I think it'd be cool to also add in some sort of shadow. Now the problem is, well, we turned off the specular. So I wonder if we could copy all these into the color channel because we can't get shadow on the luminance channel. Um, but I'd love to get uh, some shadow falling on the ground here. That'd be a cool addition. Um, so let me see. Okay, so I don't think it's going to be too hard. It's going to take a second to copy this over into there. Turn that on. Turn that off. Go over here. Oh, let me make sure it's on the right screen. Grab the Luma's channel. Drag it into the color. Drop it off. Turn it on. Uh, and in fact, we didn't even use the color overlay on a lot of these. So I'm just going to do the base channel. We should be able to do this really quick. Hopefully not mess anything up. Color channel ground luminance ground place place on cool that's pretty much all i wanted it's all in the color channel but that means that with those all fixed like that i think we can go and put a compositing tag and say yes composite the background i want one there i want one there and i guess on the tower so okay now it looks the same again with color channel turn on exactly what we want and now the hope is we can go into our skylight here and turn on a soft shadow and let's see okay so the soft shadow is doing something um and now i'm going to grab all of these compositing tags and i'm going to say that you don't self shadow so the idea, hopefully, would be that they're casting a shadow onto the ground. Now, actually, what I think would be better is maybe a hard shadow, not a soft shadow. So, okay, there we go. So you see we're getting these very harsh shadows casting. I think a cloud is casting some shadows down. I'm going to say the clouds do not cast shadow. There we go. So the clouds aren't. So now you see we're getting these shadows casting on, from the trees onto the ground, which is cool. Um, but let's go ahead and move our light from its current position. Where is it? Object? Oh, there. Okay, so I'm going to scoot it down here. So it's a little more frontal. Okay, so now it's casting over there. I think I might want, want for almost directly from the side. Okay, cool. Like, that's okay. Um, so the only thing that I want that to do is... Oh, yeah, we want to chill that way out. So I'm going to grab our shadow, and I'm going to say the density is only like 15. So the idea here, yeah, so we're getting some soft shadow, just a little bit of placement on the ground. We'll try jumping up to 25. Yeah, there's just a little bit of extra fun breakup going on, casting on there. Not much of a difference. Uh, there's a little self-shadowing going up on the our tower here. I'm not sure why. I turn off self-shadow. That means the individual objects are casting out to the other ones. What we could do is just grab all those and say uh, connect and delete which means they should all be the same object now, and it shouldn't have broken the UVs, and now it's not casting a shadow on itself, so that worked fine. Um, and Okay, so that's working well. Quite pleased overall. Um, so in order to wrap this one, what I might do is um, let's get some atmospheric stuff going, which would definitely be fun. So we could create a environment 
And this this is a bit of a heavy hammer. Let's don't affect the background. And we need to make the range really big. So you can see we've got this foggy effect. I'm going to make the number really big. Let's cut that in half. So now you can see we got this little haze traveling through. Now this will affect the clouds and the ground. It's not going to affect the sky because I turned off effect background. Um, so now we can choose the color of our haze. And it's going to kind of affect the overall tone of the scene. So you can see we add in this red. Or we can add in something warm and brighten it up. Or we can add in a blue and cool down the shadows. So that's kind of cool. Um, and you know, then the smaller we make this number, the bigger effect it's going to have. We're going to have all this atmospheric perspective. Now we could make it pretty strong in this kind of distance, and then pull back on its overall effect. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, and it's a fun, it's a fun effect to do. But let's just see. Okay, so that what that's what it looks like with it on. That's what it looks like with it off. Uh, maybe I went too far because I'm almost not seeing it. Oh, let's put the strength back up and make the distance. That's what I was just messing up. So, I mean, and even that, like I cranked that up a lot, and now it's really adding a ton of overall atmosphere. Um, but it's pretty cool. Like, I do like it. It brings everything together and gives you this nice depth traveling through the entire thing. Um, now, in addition to that, you could always do some visible lights to... Uh, to, like, add in a little bit of fog in these lower areas. So... We could, uh, why not? We're, we're just having some fun here. Let's go and make a, I just want to see what it looks like. So we're going to start out with a light. It is no illumination, but yes on the visibility. So um, let's just move it up into the air a little bit. It's pretty far down. Okay, so it's right there. So if I hit render right now, you're going to see hopefully this little glow. So uh, what might be kind of fun, well, I mean, what we could do is make a nice big one here and then move it off into our corner. It's even kind of arbitrary, but by doing that, we're going to get this bright glow over there. So we kind of got this sunshine effect going. Boom, instantly, especially with us doing this kind of just 2D composition, adding a little warmth there, and boom, we got this nice bright blowing out effect happening through. Pretty, pretty neat. I like that. Um, now, let's go ahead and duplicate that, and I'm just going to call that warm glow and let's go and grab this one i don't know if this is gonna look any good but i'm going to move it's interesting even where that got placed it's way in the background there so um i'm inclined to grab that and move it more forward here so that we're actually going to blow out the tower a little bit yeah, I'm fine with that. But now we've got our second one. And what I kind of like to do here would be make this a volumetric light. So what this one should do is cast some kind of god rays throughout the scene. Um, and I want to see these super blatantly. So I'm going to make it really bright, really yellow. And we're going to have to make it cast some shadow. So I'm going to say soft, soft shadow. And let's see, let's see what we get. I'm going to move it down. And uh, shadow, maybe okay. We, uh, we okay. We do a full shadow. Let's go and make it. Uh, does hard shadow change it? I'm really not seeing the effect. Let's get more specific because I don't want to give up on that yet. I'm gonna make a spotlight. I'm gonna become the spotlight. So I'm gonna say set active object as camera, and now I become the spotlight. So now I can zoom around. Go and find our watchtower and view it from the angle I want, which is right here. And now we've got a very specific spotlight casting in from generally the direction that our light is coming. So now I can go back to our default camera. And let's see if we get something. Um, still not feeling it too much. I'm going to go and crank our intensity times another 10. Now I think we might be getting some significant, very rapid fall off. So I'm going to make our outer distance. I'm going to add a zero onto there. So that's a really long one. All right, so we've got, <laughs> we've got a death ray going. Not necessarily a bad thing quite yet. Um, so now we've got colored edge fall off. Don't worry about that. Uh, use fall off. Don't worry about fall off yet. Um, and I just want to make sure it's working. So what I'm going to do is become the light again. And where is our edge fall off where is our sample or oh, our sample distance is really big i'm gonna make this number pretty small sample distance is really important it's the resolution of the shadow um 
But where's our cone? Oh, under our detail. I'm going to make our cone a lot smaller. Unfortunately, I don't know what I just did, but some setting I changed made, so I'm not seeing the cone, but now I've got a tiny cone on that. So now if I go back here, I got some very distinct, <laughs> the death ray is in full effect. Um, but right there, I feel like we are seeing a bit of a cone. So I still got hope that we might get something. Um, so I'm going to go lower and aim a little bit more behind it. Oh, okay. Our cone is just so far away that it's become impossible to see. So if I change that now, I should be able to see it. So now we just need to make sure that I should probably make a new viewport, but I, I, I hate breaking those. Once you break your viewport, it's a pain to fix them. Um, render. All right. Well, apparently that distance was really important. Although we could try and make it brighter, unless I made the distance less than it was casting. Outer distance, add another one. Back to death ray. Oh, wow, actually our distance is cutting off still. Um, but I made this cartoonishly bright. Drop that off by one. Okay, you can see that the shadow is indeed working. It's just cartoonishly bright. Back down again. Okay, definitely getting somewhere. Back down again. There we go. So now we're starting to get something where you see we are getting the rays a little bit. Now, I don't think cranking up the shadow there emphasizes it at all, but I'm going to try. Let's go and cartoonishly crank that up. Hey, I'm not really feeling the emphasis anymore. Oh, it's not any more of an emphasis than uh, it had begun with. Um, but there is potential. So I'm going to... Um, we're going to stretch out that beam... Yeah, so, okay, we're getting these rays. They're casting across. We get this warm glow overall. We're definitely getting a little bit of a breakup pattern, which I'm fine with there. I feel like our radius might be a little bit bigger and maybe a little bit brighter. I mean, this is this is actually getting a little cartoonishly bright, like the way it's going over there. I'm fine with it as if it's coming from the clouds, but let's not go above 100 for sure. This extra warmth, though, I thought that would be overdoing it, but I kind of like that extra yellow coming in here. Let's try making it a little whiter. Well, the white's a little less boring than getting the color fully in there. And honestly, at a certain point, you can, you know, there's a lot you'd be able to do in Photoshop here. Uh, we've got our visibility. We can use our fall off again, so this should fall off as we go. Actually, I seem to brighten up the beginning, which is kind of cool as well. Um, yeah, that light beam is definitely being a light beam. Um, it does make me think I'd want to go higher and aim lower, but at the same time, I kind of like it. Uh, now we got that warmer glow, so it's making me want to make my environment a little bit stronger by shortening the distance. Yeah, so shortening that so we get all this more depth going. The only problem is that it's affecting the clouds. I really don't want to affect the clouds. Um, but even though those are pure luminance, they're still affected. I don't think there's anything on the... Uh, there's no setting that makes that... Uh, be an exception like those are affected there they're not exclude can I exclude the environment that'd be amazing sadly no the environment just is going to kick those uh, clouds butts if we crank it so why don't we just split the difference so they still fall off a little bit Oop, and I killed the environment tag whoopsie undo 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 we do need that I just need to delete that out. That, I meant to delete that, not the tag. Uh, so now split the difference again. Render. Okay, cool. Now we get our beam going again. And it's looking pretty good. Uh, I'm going to jump into the chat in a second um, and see uh, if there's any comments or anything you'd like to see me try and kind of temporarily add to this or something to squeak in at the end. Uh, go ahead and pop it in there now. Uh, I'm just going to fix a couple of quick UV things. Because uh, this tower is such the uh, the focal point, I just want to make sure that one's looking good for the final uh, thumbnail here. So let's give this a quick save as number E. And we'll go back to our, let's rename this, grounds. We've got our lookout tower. Uh, this should just be renamed tower now. And now we can go back to our UV edit bloop and now i want to fix these so we can go back to my selection mode and actually we were doing a pretty good job of selecting these from the top view so 
if I go and do more polygon selection, which is great. I'm going to grab that to there to there. And that grabs all of those. I don't want all of those. I just want them up to a little tricky. Boom! That was actually nowhere near as hard as I thought it would be. Um, and then, honestly, I've got to be careful to undo my view, but I don't want those. I don't want those. I don't want those. Whoa! It's easy now. Don't want those. Don't want those. Okay, nice. Undo view, undo view, undo view. And now I can refrontal projection those and yeah, move these move these up nice and bright excellent that should fix the one that was bugging me the most yeah so that's nice and flat now and i just want to fix that corner those are a little bit weird there so we'll do essentially the same thing uh, back to uv select grab that and that and that and then did manage to miss some of those, and I do need all of them. Better. And now, essentially the same process. Deselect all of those. And now, deselect the ones that should be extra dark. Hold that middle mouse button and shift to shrink that. I have to zoom up again. Don't want those interior ones. In fact, let's go to the tool and say, don't worry about uh, tolerance selection. I want to deselect everything there. Everything there. Those. Those and those. Undo, 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 undo. View. Refrontal projection. And those were the ones that were breaking the effect. So now I can move all of those to the dark side. I want a nice fat gradient on this one. So I'm going to do a non-uniform scale. Full range and significantly bigger there. A nicer gradient overall. There we go. There we go. All right. That was the one thing I want to fix with the UVs because that was the only one that was bugging me. Render. Yeah, so nice and flat on that side, nice and flat on that side now, which is what I was going for. Um. Yeah, pretty happy with that. I'm going to check the chat. Um, yeah, oh, uh, what is the undo view keyboard shortcut? So it's control or command, shift Z, and you can just keep on hitting it as if it's undo. Um, let's see. Yeah, that looks nice. Oh, yeah, I was going to do that one. Uh, it might not be worth it, but uh, you know, if we want to do sort of a, a, a warm glow on the ground, or like a mist, like it's like a misty morning. We could make a uh, another light here and then set it to visible. And it's going to be a visible light. And I'm going to make it kind of a misty blue. And we're going to make it a parallel spotlight. And then we're going to spin this up. It's a big old cylinder. And if we increase this cylinder to be huge and then pull it up into the air and then we pull this down, then what we should get, oh, and let's also make it not, no illumination. So that should be a very, let's go and crank it cartoonishly bright. Now we might be inside of it. Yeah, so we're inside of it. So it's going to like overwhelm everything. So uh, once again, just because of the perspective we're at, we can fake this one by rotating it towards us. It's a little hard at that angle. I'm going to spin it there and then we can spin it on Z. And as we rotate that one, then hopefully we end up outside of it. Yeah, you see we're outside of it and now we got this glow down there. So now if we pull this one up, yeah, as we pull it up, we want to stay outside of it, but you can see we get this glow down in these lower, like down in the valley, we've got this glow. So we got to be careful, but yeah, right around there. And now we can make this a little bit more blue. And then we can make it a little bit whiter, bring the brightness back down to something reasonable. And there we go. So you get this lighter, 
like glow down in the low area, but not up in this upper area. Um, and that, and honestly, we might be able to turn off this overall environment effect and kind of make it more manually so it doesn't really affect the clouds. Um, but uh, I'm not going to worry about that. But now you can see we get this nice little mist. We could even put in some fog in there so that, or it's put in like some visual noise. But at the resolution that is down there, I don't think it's going to make much of an effect. So I'm not going to worry about that. But yeah, a little bit of a glow down there. Uh, honestly, it's cool. Um, but, um, and I want to keep it, but I'm going to make it a little bit lighter and let's have it not have as much effect. So yeah, just a little bit of a, a mist down there. Um, let's see, somebody's saying, can you make the shadow map larger and or hard shadows for, for the God Ray? Um, I don't know if that would make much of a difference, uh, but let's try it. Um, I think that's this one. Yeah, let's call it, uh, Rays. And it's already a soft shadow map. Let's try making it a hard shadow map. And see, I'm not seeing really much in the way of a visible difference there. And if we make a soft, we could A-B it, but I'm just eyeballing it. it might, I don't know, it might be a hair. But if we go to our shadow map and crank up the shadow map to like four times the resolution, like I'm continuing not to see really much of a difference on it. There might be settings here that we could do it, but it's really about like what is the light catching and how, what percentage of it's being blocked out. So it's just not that much of a resolution uh, that we're blocking out because it's so big. It might work on the overall cloud effect if we made the clouds bigger, but that's just not a, that's not going to have much of an effect there. Uh, looking at it, I wouldn't mind going up in the air a little bit higher and aiming it down a little bit more. Um, could have made everything worse, but... Yeah, okay, the beams are a little bit more down. I like that a little bit more. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, so that's all looking that's all looking really good. I mean, I guess what I would do right now is let's just let's just take a let's make an actual render here and spend a few minutes in Photoshop, like maybe tweak the colors, shift some things around. I'm not going to do a whole bunch of different passes or anything out of here cuz I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy with the way it looks overall. But let's go ahead and give that another quick save. I'm going to go to my render settings. It's already kind of set to this big physical. It's a nice big resolution. Uh, I'm Like I said, I'm not going to do any additional passes. We're just going to work with what we got. Um, is that entirely true? I don't know. Because we could, you know, we could do things like make a ambient occlusion layer, which could be something. Uh, and then there's the atmosphere layer that might give us something. And then there's never a bad thing to have a depth pass. So... Um, if we render these out, I might just copy and paste them into Photoshop if it works. So we'll just let the progressive render go for a while until it looks good enough. And, uh, do, 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 uh, ba, ba, ba. progressive pass, progressive pass. Uh, are we getting, okay, we are getting layers. The, uh, oh, look at that. That's, wow, look. <laughs> all right, our atmosphere pass looks awesome by itself. Like, there's our render all by itself. Uh, ambient occlusion pass, cool to work from, I guess. And depth pass gave us nothing. But uh, I'm not complaining. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, that can keep rendering a copy. Let's go into a Photoshop, open up a new one. It should be the resolution. And now we can give it a second, a long second apparently, to uh, open up the file. It's completely frozen in my mouse. Hopefully it didn't crash the uh, computer. Oh, oh, come on. There we go. There we go. Wow, Photoshop. Uh, paste. Oh, this is a thing that happens. Uh, can anybody tell me why this happens? Do you, think I, do you see I just pasted from the copy, and I pasted, and the color came through completely different. It looks kind of cool, but obviously that is significantly different than what we're seeing here. And I know it's probably a color profile thing, but it kind of drives me nuts. Um... I'm going to save it as a still image and maybe that will, there are no, there is no uh, alpha layer. I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, and let's go ahead and save this into episode three renders. Uh, that's fine. And let's see if that opens as a correct one instead of this weird dark pasted one. Um, yeah, you can remove color profile. Um, uh, okay, well, what's like? Do you fix that in Photoshop or Cinema? It's just something I haven't specifically addressed. Uh, open. So yeah, there. When I save it and open it, it does open properly. Uh, but even copy and pasting the secondary layers, I think, will have the same problem. Uh, yeah, somebody's saying gamma problems, but it, it's just that it's like copy and pasting breaks it, but saving it doesn't. It's a little frustrating. 
Uh, not something I'm going to worry about right now. But in our picture viewer, we can go into our separate layers, say view single pass, go to our atmosphere. This is probably going to break it as well, but I'm just using these as raw materials. Um, so we can go and kill that darker one. And then here I'm going to paste. Um, oh, the, oh, maybe you can't copy and paste the individual pass layers. Give me one second. Atmosphere, single pass. Edit, copy, edit, paste. We should probably stop it from rendering because it's I think it's kicking the computer's butt a little bit. All right, we got to give it a second. I said paste and now it's freaking out again. Let me make sure that oh, it's still rendering. Yes, I want to stop it. Thank you. Mm, interesting the paste it didn't work as well but let's go ahead and uh, go to multi-pass on this and we have to save it as some sort of multi-pass image file save as can we do photoshop psd photoshop document hopefully still image layers alpha channel no okay uh yeah that's fine Okay, sorry, that took longer than it should have. We could have just saved a save file, and that might have saved us a little bit of time. Thump. Oh, well, it saved out the multi-pass ones. All right, fine. Uh, that's all I really wanted. So now we can go and select our atmosphere channel. Normal. Select copy, and then we can go over here and paste it as an option that we can use. And then we can go back into this one. Go to ambient occlusion, copy, and paste it into this one as something that we can also use to do some fun things so uh let's kind of full screen that a little bit and start playing around i always like making a duplicate of my base layer underneath so i can always go back to that so the first thing we might do here i mean i don't know if it's a good idea but i tend to make a little bit of a vignette even if it's incredibly subtle so making a little circular vignette and I usually kind of go to the focal point. Now we already did a little bit of that manually, but if I were to make a big old gradient there, it's backwards. I hit control I to invert it. Now we could take that and set it to overlay. Oops, that's soft light. Let's go to overlay. You see it's going to completely blow it out and make this darker. But now we could go and just put a little bit of that overlay. Just it draws your eye in that little bit. You could also set it to multiply so it just makes it darker over to that point. So it darkens off everything else and goes over. So yeah, I'm I'm fine with that. We can go ahead and, um, I mean, it doesn't hurt to make a vibrance layer. I don't, I don't like when people overuse the vibrance in photographs, but this is a good layer to go and yeah, crank this up. You can see we can just saturate our colors up a little bit. And especially when you're thinking about the reference we had, how kind of saturated that was. They're very pure, crazy colors. So I'm actually fine pulling that vibrance up and made that more. Let's pull our saturation up to see if we, because, yeah, it's going to quickly get neon, which on its own way, you do that. It's like, okay, that, I don't know, it's, it works. I, I, I want to say I don't like it, but I actually kind of do. So maybe maybe keeping some of that. Yeah, that's not bad. It's pretty interesting. It makes that section really intense. And now let's go ahead and um, uh, let's see. Well, I mean, uh, doing a texture overlay is just something I think tends to be kind of fun. Um, I don't know. Give me a split second to go through my files. I had some recent texture overlays I had been doing. I want to see if any of them look any good um one split second go into my rocket lasso folder my website folder my graphics folder um this crack uh, that's not much of one let's see what this is oh it's just kind of this uh, wall paint i thought i had more than that oh well we'll just see if this does anything um so we got that, and now we could set that to, I guess, overlay. But we're going to have to go real easy on it. Yeah, no, I don't like that. And then let's try multiply. But I'm doubting I'm going to like that. Like just getting a little bit of something. Yeah, it's, it's just it's not a good grunge layer to be playing with. It's the only one I seem to have saved from some recent work I was doing. So never mind on that grunge. I just don't have them handy. Um, but I do like a little bit of a texture overlay and that kind of thing. Uh, now, we do have this interesting atmosphere layer, so we could always put a um, 
is it uh, a linear dodge? Yeah, a linear dodge could be something where you can just like individually crank that up a little bit or down a little bit. But honestly, when you have that kind of fun layer like this, um, just playing around with our different layers, like saying darken. So now it's kind of like, now we've got that same, you know, it kind of has a spooky element to it by itself. But if we darken it, then it, we kind of introduce some of the detail back in again. But let's just play with some other ones. So we got multiply. So it's kind of a night scene with an alien beam coming down. Color burn, oh, stylish, but not what I'm looking for. I'm just scrolling, using my scroll wheel now. Darker color is kind of interesting. Like it's, uh, once again, introducing some of that atmospheric detail in. I don't think we're going to end up using any of these, but it's just kind of fun to go through. Lighten, uh, it's adding in a little bit more atmosphere down in the bottom area, not specifically better than what we had. Screen, do, do, do. lighter color. Uh, overlays, making that kind of really saturated and intense. Hard light, and these are the weird ones. I don't expect these to give us anything. Whoa, that's a weird one. Weird one, weird one. That one's kind of cool in a desaturated kind of way, but it's just saturation layer, so I guess that makes sense. Um, so this one, I wasn't specifically doing much for us. Putting it on the, just honestly, even something on normal and just like pulling it in a little bit, you could be like, okay, we're kind of changing the uh, ambience a little bit. And then even there, I mean, it's a cool looking layer by itself, and if we were to just pop open the hue, saturation, brightness, we could like shift the colors around a little bit. And, you know, it's just like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting right there. I like, I, I kind of like those colors, even default. And then we could go into our warmer colors and individually shift that around. And uh, yeah, go for a nice gold and warm color. And now we can set this to something like hue. Uh, hue's terrible. Let's try color, color's better. And now, like, you know, now we're getting this warm and cool and now we can just uh, use our opacity here and introduce that into the layer more to kind of make it a little bit more monochromatic. So we can take the edge off of these really saturated colors and pull those back. So, you know, right there, kind of interesting. Uh, is it actually helping or doing much to it? Like, I, I don't know. I kind of like this cartoony, oversaturated look. Uh, but something to keep in mind. And once again, uh, if that's on the normal channel, like, that's pretty cool looking as a, as a standalone thing, especially since we weren't aiming for a nighttime scene. It's kind of shocking that it looks as good as it did. So all of those are valid passes. Um, and then this is just a more the darker overlaid version. Um, now we do just have our base pass here. I might want to pop open something like a Curves. Curves is pretty fun as a modif modifier layer. So we could um, like just see, okay, let's darken the overall shot kind of neat we can brighten it but that immediately goes too bright but then something that you could do is like darken the dark parts but then they immediately curve back into the normal bright parts so now we're darkening yeah getting a little darker on some of those I, i'm not disliking that um the the there's even, it's even introducing like some purples in there which is interesting but uh just maybe maybe a hint of it darkening that overall and now we can go into our individual colors and this can just be kind of fun like okay introducing a little more warm color in there i kind of like that uh and then you know grabbing this low point pulling the upper down not specifically liking it i mean i kind of have a rule with design on everything which is if it's not adding something distinctly if it's not like oh i like that better then it was better not to add it like just remove it so we could intensify the green or lower the green Actually, lowering the green, I don't, I don't mind lowering that green a little bit. Let's try grabbing the, this dark point so we can darken that up. Not much of a difference. Top one it introduces some purples, which is interesting. And then we'll just play with the blue. Now, it's not unusual for me to take the blue and make some changes there. Like, yeah, uh, I don't want to change that middle one. But taking the dark point and being like, okay, I want to introduce more blues into the dark areas and less blues into the light areas. And you're gonna really kind of emphasize like a warm and cool look. Um, and then even like right here, like there's a more of a chilly effect. It's kind of look a little bit more blue. If we pull it out, it's gonna become like warmer. This is just like a hot day. Um, but overall, actually the, the blue, the, the changing the blue is not much having much of an effect. Let's go back to layers and turn that on and off and see. Like, yeah, actually I like that. You see, uh, there's a, I feel like there's a little bit more of a balance of colors here, like introducing those more intense purples and those these darker, warm colors. I feel like there's a little bit more of a balance there. So that's cool. Uh, and then we've got our final layer here, which is just this ambient occlusion. It's not doing much, um, but we could uh, reintroduce this by multiplying it. And then we have some control over making some darker shadows if we want there to be some. 
So like just pulling those back in or out. Um, I'm not really, I'm not getting a strong vibe one way there. I guess making those pop out a little bit more is kind of nice. So like a little hint, 33% seems to do something for me. Uh, I'm going to try increasing our, no, I don't want to do that. I do like a little bit. Um, so uh, let me think, is there anything else I'd want to do? I mean, if we're doing a sci-fi thing, I've got those other tricks where I like to, and we'll do it here, but we will not keep it, I can guarantee. And we should also save this. Um, let's go ahead and save it as our Photoshop document. Uh, feel free to save over that one. Okay, so I usually do, and there's a shortcut for this I've just, uh, oh, I can't save over it because it's already being used. Fine, E. F. Okay. Wait, it just saved as a TIFF. I don't want a TIFF. I want a Photoshop document. Shablams. Okay. Um, there's a shortcut, and I'll, one day I'll look it up again, but you can flatten all the visible, but as a copy, I'm just going to flatten everything visible, copy it, and undo, and then go to the new layer and paste it. So I've got all of my layer flattened down. Because now I could do something like duplicating my entire layer. And you guys have probably seen me do this in old videos. But I can go and do something like a Gaussian blur. And now uh, let's find a... Like if I start blurring this a decent amount. Then we could take that and overlay it on top of the entire image. And you get more of this blown out glow. So everything gets a little bit glowy. As an alternative, you can invert that. So control... Command I and invert it, and you're going to even out your overall image. You see how everything gets a little bit more uniform, like it's not quite so blown out over here. Uh, and if we desaturate it, then we should get rid of those color, those wonky colors. So you can see that we're going from that, which has a little bit more of a distinct angle, to that, which is a little more flat because it's the inversion. Uh, if I were to put that to a normal, you can see what we're doing to it. We're taking that and overlaying it. So usually if I'm doing a, like a spooky or, you know, energy kind of sci-fi thing, then that becomes a cool layer to put on there. But you can see here that like the blowing out is just too much. We could pull it back and be like, okay, just give me a little bit of that. And honestly, actually a little bit is not bothering me. Like only like 5%, but it's a little bit of a glow, a little bit brightening and reemphasizing of everything. So yeah, that's cool. Um... So um, besides doing that little texture overlay, and even there, it would be cool if we had like a layer mask or a depth mask where we could like make certain layers have um, a little bit more of a pop to it. Or we could take like, you know, even here, it's not something we should do. But if we had a mask, we could select the mountains and say, okay, those have a certain texture. And this tower, it has a different texture. We could layer those up and it would be kind of fun. Um, but I think saving this one here is good. Uh, the last thing that would be kind of fun is let's just take our original layer. So that's what we, this is what we brought in from Cinema 4D and this is what we're exiting with from Photoshop. So a little more atmosphere and a little bit more emphasis on the colors and the shadows uh, and definitely more saturated um, is the big difference of what we did there. So I'm gonna delete that layer because it's redundant. Um, this layer, we didn't end up doing anything with. So I'm gonna delete that layer it wasn't really anything to begin with. I'm going to save this layer in here in case people want to play with it in the Photoshop document, which you will get with uh, the technician tier from Patreon if you're supporting me on there. Uh, but let's go ahead and give that a quick save. I'm going to jump into the chat, and we will officially wrap this one up. So there is what we just created completely from scratch today. Uh, I'm quite pleased with it um, for, you know, especially since we just kind of learned that UV mapping technique, a way of texturing via UV mapping. So quite, quite happy with that. So uh, I'm going to click on the broadcaster, which I've completely lost. Where's the icon? There it is. Hello. Boom. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, getting a little darker over here. Let me turn this light on. Boom. Uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. I'm going to click on the chat here, see what uh, everybody was saying. Oh, yeah, uh, some people adding the uh, shortcut for merging all the Photoshop layers and then pasting it at the top effectively is Control-Alt-Shift-E, which is quite the shortcut, but it's a good one. Uh, I use it pretty often for those types of techniques. Um, let's see. Uh, Andy's got some hints for 
uh, leveling. Oh yeah, we never did levels. We could have controlled the darkness and lightness there. Um, but he's saying there's a cool levels adjustment for Command Alt L. Um, saying that it will sort out the colors in Gamma. I will have to try that out, so that's cool. Um, so yeah, color profile was the other thing. Uh, I'm quite pleased with this one overall. It's uh, it's the best looking thing that we've made in a Rocket Lasso live episode combining it. I'm I'm quite happy with it. Uh, although I'm a, I'm a little sad that we didn't do a whole bunch of questions again. Um, like I do want to do more of a rapid fire at one point, but uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So it'll be fun to post this, and this whole video would make you know it's going to make very good one to post around. Um, so I guess we will uh, we will wrap this one up. Uh, thanks for everybody who's in the room hanging out. Uh, we got uh, Mouse is in there, Scott of course, Paul. Um, other, I'm trying to name the people I didn't already call out earlier. Spear Factory hanging out. Zach, hello, welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, hey everybody. Uh, so uh, we will officially wrap this one up. Uh, some final shout outs, some important details here. Uh, we've got a Slack channel, the official Rocket Lasso Slack channel, where we've got a great community, some great moderators, just people asking and answering questions and doing cool group projects. Uh, lots of activity going on in there. Make sure you go and join us there. And then very important is um, right now the primary income I have for doing these things is the Patreon I have set up until maybe future in the future I can start getting some tools and other things for sale potentially. But in the meantime, uh, this is my primary source of income. So if you want to support me and the stream, you can get access to these videos early. And at a different level, you will get access to all of the scene files I just created and saved. You would just straight up get all those scene files. In addition to additional bonus streams and early access to guests I'm going to have on the live streams. And there's other perks on there. Go and check out the Rocket Lasso Patreon. There will be a link in the description. Uh, if you want to support me here, especially since we're doing the first bonus live stream tomorrow. So uh, you might want to go check that out if you want to come and hang out then. Uh, in the meantime, I will see everybody live next week from the NAB show floor at the Maxon booth uh, on Thursday. So I will be posting on Rocket Lasso's Twitter account, all the details there. So make sure you're checking that out, or I'm sure we'll be talking about it in the Slack channel as well. Um, so yeah, go ahead and follow us at all of those normal channels. It seems like Twitch is the stream that's most cooperating. We've been trying to stream to Facebook and to YouTube, and those are not working so well, but Twitch has been really reliable. Um, but yeah, do, do a little research on those. But I just want to say thank you again, everybody, and we'll wrap this one up, and um, I will see you next week from NAB. So bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.